Resume your seats. Members, before we commence business today, I want to address two different matters. Firstly, over recent months, we have seen a very worrying trend of a variety of threats, attacks, vandalism and abuse, including of a sexually violent nature, on social media against a range of people, including ministers, members on all sides of the House, journalists, other figures, the cultural organisations and ordinary families. Indeed, this is almost becoming so commonplace that one of the difficulties that I have in this chair, particularly when considering matters of the day, is that we could have a discussion condemning specific threats at the start of our business every week recently. And I want to acknowledge that members, including Linda Dillon, Mike Nesbitt, Matthew O'Toole and Michelle O'Neill, have all wanted to raise these issues recently, as have other members. I think it is important in my role as Speaker that I record that this Assembly is built on the principle of this being a democratic society in which we uphold freedom of expression, the right of people to have different views and the ability to ask questions. Parties may wish to come together to explore how a substantive discussion on these issues could be added to the order paper in the time ahead. However, for today, I know that I speak for members on every side of this House when I say on behalf of the Assembly that we absolutely condemn those behind all these threats, attacks and abuse and stand in solidarity with those who are on the receiving end of it. Moving on to a different subject, I want to remind members that today will be the first plenary sitting during which members may join the meeting remotely. I wrote to all members on Friday, the 19th of February, to make provision for hybrid assembly plenary proceedings in accordance with Standing Order 110, and I asked members to familiarise themselves with this guidance. I want to thank all of those assembly staff who have worked hard over the past three weeks to put in place the practical and the procedural measures to allow this change, bearing in mind that the assembly only gave its approval on the 1st of February. I want to highlight a number of key points. Firstly, members participating remotely should act in accordance with the same standards of decorum and behaviour expected as if they were in the chamber. Secondly, members wishing to speak should ensure that their name is added to the speaking list in good time in order to be called. Thirdly, attending remotely does not impact on the quorum required in the chamber under standing orders. And finally, when speaking remotely, members will not see the clock, so for timed contributions, we will advise members from the chair when their time has come to an end. Inevitably, when incorporating the greater use of technology, we are likely to even have our fair share of technical problems, but hopefully they will be minor, and indeed, we might even have the odd comedy moment. However, we should keep in mind the reasons that we are undertaking this change at this time, and with the patient support and good humour of all members, I am sure that this new method will quickly become embedded in our business. And let's move on. Thank you. Thank you. Last Tuesday, Mr Speaker, the member for South Belfast, Mrs Paula Bradshaw, challenged the validity of the introduction of the Severe Fatal Impairment Abortion Amendment Bill, which she rightly ruled has been properly carried out and within the legislative competence of the Northern Ireland Assembly. The member for South Belfast continued to challenge the Speaker's ruling at the Health Committee last Thursday that this bill should not have been allowed introduction and has requested to see your legal advice. Is it in order for the member for South Belfast to continue to challenge your authority and what action will be taken to deal with the member and reassure this House that you will resist her efforts? Well, I thank the member for his point of order and I, I don't want to rehearse my response to the member Paula Bradshaw last week. Suffice to say that the uh, procedures which had uh, been embraced by Paul Given were totally consistent with our standing orders and our procedures and totally correct. I have no doubt, therefore, that in the due course of the process of that legislation, that there will be a lot of debate, a lot of scrutiny, as, as should be the case. And I have no doubt that people, including the likes of the Human Rights Organisation, will ensure they have a voice to be heard in that scrutiny. Uh, the, the, the content of discussions at committees is really not a matter for me to make comment on specifically, but the member has put his point of view on the record. He has drawn attention of the House to the remarks of the member in question, Paula Bradshaw. I haven't heard or seen any of the Hansard reports of the meeting. Um, it's just been raised by yourself in the chamber to me personally. Um, I take note of that, and suffice to say that anyone who will ask for the legal advice of a speaker will just be simply advised that that advice is, as always, privileged and wouldn't be shared. Okay, so the member has put his issue of concern on the record. Thank you. 
The next item on the agenda is a public petition. Mr John O'Dowd has sought leave to present the public petition in accordance with Standing Order 22. The member will have up to three minutes to speak. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Karen Collier. Uh, I wish to present this petition on behalf of the NUS USA, uh, the student advocacy and uh, a movement that speaks up on behalf of our students who live locally. I will read out the petition uh, wording, Mr Speaker, if that is in line. Uh, on the 4th of February, the Economy Minister announced that a full-time higher education students in universities and colleges will receive a £500 COVID disruption grant, but further education part-time and non-EU international students have been denied this support. All students have experienced severe disruption throughout this pandemic, and no one deserves to be left out. We want the Economy Minister to extend this payment scheme to include educa further education, part-time and non-EU national students. The Minister should also work with other Ministers in the UK and Ireland to make sure that a support is available for students from here who study elsewhere. And that petition has been signed on behalf of 3,313 signatures. Mr Speaker, in conclusion, I think there is cross-party support for the petition and the work of the NUS USI. And I think it is particularly unfortunate that those students, full time students studying in further education colleges, who are most likely to come from a lower income background, have not been afforded this grant. So, Mr. Speaker, I support the students' movement in their, in their work and their continued, call for, uh, their continued call for this payment to be made to others. I will present the petition to you in due course. Normally, uh, the member knows that I would normally invite the member to bring his petition to the table here. Um, however, in light of social distancing, I would ask the member to remain in his place and make arrangements to submit the petition to my office later. I do want to thank the member for bringing this petition to the attention of the Assembly. And once received, I will forward the petition to the Minister for the Economy and send a copy to the committee. Thank you. The next item of business members on the order paper is a motion regarding committee membership. As with other similar motions, it will be treated as a business motion and there will be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That Ms Paula Bradley replace Mr Guy Middleton as a member of the Committee on Procedures. Can I call Mr Keith Buchanan to move the motion? Moved. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. The country no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Moving on to the next item of business. The next item of business are motions to approve two draft statutory rules which relate to the direct payments to farmers. And there will be a single debate on both motions. I will ask the clerk to read the first motion, then call on the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on the motions as listed on the order paper. When all who wish to speak have done so, I shall put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read under the record, and I will call the Minister to move the motion. The question will then be put on that motion. If that is clear, then I shall proceed. Clerk, please read the motion. That the draft direct payments to farmers amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2021 be approved. Thank you, and I call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment, and rural affairs to move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move. Thank you. And the business committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call on the minister to open the debate on the motions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The current direct agricultural support schemes, which include the basic payment scheme, are worth over £293 million annually to farmers in Northern Ireland. The purpose of the regulation I am bringing forward today is to ensure that the current schemes continue to operate effectively and to implement improvements and simplifications wherever possible. Leaving the EU has provided Northern Ireland with an unprecedented level of regional discretion and flexibility with regard to future agricultural support in Northern Ireland. As Minister Putz has said in this House, this is one of the most significant changes in policy affecting the agricultural sector in over 40 years. We now have the opportunity to develop an agricultural support framework better suited to local needs. One of the benefits of leaving the EU 
and one that will provide for and secure long-term sustainability within our industry. And the regulations that I am bringing forward today are the first step in this transition. Moving to the first regulation, the legislative amendments introduced in the Direct Payments to Farmers Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 will maintain the status quo as far as possible and are largely technical. No substantive policy changes are being made and farmers will see no change on the ground as a result of this regulation. EU Regulation 1307-2013, the Direct Payments Regulation, contains financial ceilings which are used to calculate direct payments to farmers across the UK. However, it only includes financial ceilings up to and including the 2020 claim year. This SR specifies the manner by which DERA will determine the annual financial ceiling to calculate payments beyond, 2021, uh, beyond 2020 in Northern Ireland. The ceiling for each future year must be equivalent to Northern Ireland's share of the UK national ceiling specified in the Direct Payments Regulation for 2020. The ceiling will no longer be specified in legislation, but will be determined administratively. Setting the ceiling in legislation is no longer necessary, given the context of allocating funds to EU member states is not applicable. This change will not alter the amount of money being paid to farmers, and the Department will remain constrained by the Treasury allocation. The SR makes other minor amendments to ensure the schemes can continue to operate effectively beyond 2020. This includes replacing some dates which were specific to the 2020 scheme year with equivalent dates which are not year-specific. It also removes from the retained EU law provisions which are not applicable in Northern Ireland. It similarly removes some provisions which are no longer operating in Northern Ireland, such as the requirements for beneficiaries to meet negative list rules and the ability to make payment in euro. Other amendments remove provisions which are not relevant beyond the 2020 scheme. For example, the SR removes rules concerning the transfer of funds from the 2020 direct payments budget to be used for rural development measures. Moving to the second regulation, the Direct Payments to Farmers Simplifications Regulations Northern Ireland 2021, give legal effect to the simplifications and improvements that my predecessor Edwin Putz announced to the Assembly on the 17th of November 2021. The simplifications are intended to make the direct agricultural support scheme simpler for both applicants and those administering the schemes. Part 2 removes the greening payment with the money being incorporated into the basic payment scheme. The requirement to not plough environmentally sensitive greenland is retained as set out in Article 32A. Greening requirements for crop rotation ecological focus area and retention of permanent grassland had a, a, an eligible uh, uh, impact in Northern Ireland, where over 90% of land is permanent grassland and there is an abundance of landscape features uh, such as hedges and shucks to uh, meet ecological focus area requirements. Consequently, meeting greening requirements was largely an administrative exercise for farmers. Indeed, the greening requirements were actually counterproductive in Northern Ireland, where our cereal area continues to decline, which raises biodiversity concerns as grass becomes ever more dominant. Part 3 limits the number of entitlements that can be allocated from or increased in value from the regional reserve to 90 for a young farmer new entrant. This brings it into line with the uh, 90 hectares limit for the young farmer's payment. It also removes eligibility of a farm business young farmer for the young farmer's payment after three unsuccessful applications from the 2022 scheme year onwards. Uh, part four makes a change to the over declaration penalty so that these penalties cannot exceed the amount of payment due prior to the penalty being applied. Part five removes the concept of a cross-border holding within the UK. Farms with land in more than one UK region will make separate applications to each paying agency and then will be paid separately. 
Part 6 changes the amount at which payments are capped from €150,000 to £190,000. This is a technical change to reflect the fact that capping did not apply to the greening payment and these amounts are now incorporated into the basic payment. The aim is to, as far as possible, have a neutral impact on capping. Part 7 sets the minimum control rate for inspections at 1% for scheme applications, but the Department can increase it should the error rate increase. Part 8 makes some technical changes to the provisions on coupled payments, which allows me to introduce a protein crop payment in 2021 and 2022. Finally, Part 9 makes some consequential changes to the direct payments regulation. It also removes the 3% limit on the increase of the ba basic payment ceiling, which gives the Department more flexibility to maximise expenditure of Treasury allocations for direct payments. Together, these regulations will ensure that direct payments to farmers can continue smoothly in 2021, as well as making some significant improvements and, importantly, simplifications. And Mr Speaker, I commend them to the Assembly. Thank you. And I call the Chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture and Environment Rural Affairs, Declan Magalier. Um, um, I welcome this opportunity today to speak as Chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs and to outline the views of the Committee. Uh, leaving the EU has brought a significant change in the Common Agriculture Policy, um, as was, um, to, to which will have an impact on our agri-food sector. Policies no longer will have to uh, follow the CAP Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, and, and this has required the Department to develop a new approaches and support systems that will address the needs of our agriculture and rural communities, as well as the environment. Members will be aware that direct payments are currently worth over £293 million pounds annually, and a significant importance in sustaining the agriculture and supporting uh, viable trading options. The Department continues to consider how future payments can uh, support farming and rural communities, while supporting the sustainability and profitability of farming and the environment. This, of course, will take time, but while that work is being explored and developed, it is important that payments will continue under the existing schemes. Minister Poots, in his ministerial statement on the 17th of November 2020, spoke about his long-term vision for agriculture support, and he referred to a number of simplifications and improvements that he intended to make regarding uh, the rules of government the direct payment scheme in the 2021 scheme year. Um, the ERA committee heard from departmental officials at his meeting on the 4th of February 2021 that the SR for the direct payments to farmers uh, amendment regulations will maintain the status quo and that its provisions are largely technical in nature. Members were reassured that there will be no substantive policy changes made and importantly farmers will see no change on the ground as a result of the regulations. The department will receive its financial allocation from Treasury and farmers will continue to be, uh, to be paid. The committee heard that the ASR makes a few other minor amendments to ensure that the schemes can operate effectively beyond 2020, including replacing some specific dates to the 2020 scheme year with equivalent date schemes, dates that are not year specific. The regulations will remove the EU uh, from the EU retained law those provisions that are no longer applicable here, as well as the provisions that will no longer operate, such as the requirement for beneficiaries to meet, to meet negative list rules for the active farmer and the ability to make payments in euros. Other amendments will remove provisions that are not relevant beyond 2020. The second SR, which the committee considered the direct payment to farmer simplifications regulations, will give legal effect to the simplifications that Minister Poots announced in his ministerial statement. The committee heard uh, that they are intended to make the direct agri agriculture support scheme, such as the basic payment scheme, for example, easier for applicants and also for those who administer the schemes. The SR includes uh, setting the minimum control rate for inspections at 1% for scheme applications, but gives the Department the flexibility to increase it should the error rate um, rise. It was in this issue that the Committee received representation from the RSPB, as it had a number of concerns in respect of the reduction in inspections as outlined in Part 7 of the regulations. The Committee received oral evidence from the RSPB, and it heard that, that they were of the view that more frequent and effective inspection would, uh, would help prevent environmental decline, such as decline in water quality. RSPP had stated that they were un uncomfortable with their prospect of a bare minimum inspection rates. We were very glad that RSPB raised the concerns, 
It allowed for a clarification from the Department. That meant that both the RSPB and the Committee were content that the reductions referred to in the regulations will only apply to land eligibility. Members also raised concern with the Department with the unit entitlements for new entrants now limited to 90 hectares. We were concerned that there was danger that these changes could negatively impact on young farmers who are attempting to enter the agri-food business. The Department clarified the reasoning behind the reduction in unit size entitlement was to bring it into line with the area that can be applied for on the young farmers' payment. It aligns the two to make them more workable and easier to administer, thereby making the process simpler. At the meeting on the 4th of February, the Committee agreed with the merits of the policies, and at the meeting on the 18th of February, agreed that no objection to this rule. Um, okay. So I want to just make a few points in relation to my spokesperson role of agriculture and rural affairs within Sinn Féin. Whilst Sinn Féin welcomes the, uh, the certainty that this um, regulation brings in, and at least for this year, especially with the impact of COVID on the sector and the negative implications of Brexit, a Brexit, well, I must say, a hard Brexit, which has been imposed on them by the DUP and their Tory bedfellows. Uh, we welcome, Sinn Féin welcomes the simplifications. They make sense, such as incorporating the grading payment into the overall basic payment scheme, reduction of inspections to 1%. And anyone who represents rural areas will know that the issue of inspection has been as the bane of many farmers' life. And what happens is it can re result in a delay to the single farm payment being issued, particularly during the worst months of the year, the winter time when the stock are in and there's additional costs, and of course, over Christmas as well. And I think what this proves is that the Department can be decisive, can be decisive when it wants to be decisive. But sadly, in the case of the likes of the Dinelli farmers who have been waiting for four years, uh, there's, this is not the case. And this is the same too for the Department, for the lack of progress on the TB strategy, the ammonia accident plan, the climate change legislation, the new rural policy, the new agriculture policy. I'm sure there's many, many other areas where we've seen a lack of progress and a lack of will to make any progress. And I must also say that it is regrettable that the Minister has declined to meet the committee. And I'm reading in the farmers, farming press where the Minister has been meeting stakeholders, assuring them that he's going to be make decisions. Uh, yet, whenever the committee requested to meet him to discuss his priorities, we were turned down that request. But it's good that he's here today because it's an opportunity to see him face to face because we don't get that opportunity in the committee. And certainly in the shadow, the shadow of Brexit and COVID, which are the two big threats to our farming and agri-food agri industry and rural communities, now is a time for maximum leadership and the pursuance of the most maximal levels of funding possible to support our hard-pressed rural communities. So I have to say it was really frustrating when the Finance Minister announced a number of weeks ago that there's £251.1 million of funding available for allocation, and he specifically implored the DERA Minister to come forward with proposals. They did not. All we got were excuses that their need could not be identified, and a fear that had they got additional uh, fund funding, they could not spend it by the end of the financial year. This, to me, was a lame excuse, particularly when all of the other government departments were bidding for funding and were in the same positions as DERA was in. So, just uh, in conclusion, and that, certainly in that regard, I feel really, really strongly that the agriculture and rural communities have been let down by the department on many of these issues, particularly that last one there, the Master mentioned. And I hope that the Minister and indeed his party reflects on this here in the time ahead. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I call William Irwin. Mr. Speaker, uh, can I declare an interest in this matter as a partner in the business that received direct payments? This is an important motion, and the two pieces of the Executive Committee business before the House today are important and necessary to ensure that we have a functional payment system to both enable payments to be made in the coming year and to also shape the future of direct payments going forward. This matter was discussed at some length in the Committee a few weeks ago. And there is broad agreement that the matter should process the next stage, and I welcome the next step in the process today. Around the wider issue of payments into the, fu into the future, there is an opportunity for meaningful, meaningful change, and one that can be taken in the very best interest of our agriculture industry and natural environment, fully and firmly in mind. As I have said previously, farming and the environment very much go hand in hand, and one cannot realistically survive without the other. That is why support for farming and environment is so vital. 
As we know, direct payments are worth around £293 million per year to the industry. That is a significant assistance where there has been an understandably much debate and insistence on the need for such payments to continue. Our agri-food industry is one of the most prized assets in Northern Ireland, securing many thousands of jobs across a great number of sectors. It is, of course, important that this industry is fully supported going forward to ensure st stability and full recovery of our economy post-pandemic. The particular motion seeks to provide continuity, continuity for the industry in terms of payments and processing. And farmers will see little difference in the procedure, and there are no substantial policy changes contained therein. And for that reason, I support the motion. Thank you, and I call Patsy McLone. Erimer, Patsy McLone. Uh, I, come for you, and, uh, I thank the Minister for uh, introducing the direct payment statutory rules today. Um, the SDLP is content to accept both statutory rules on direct payments to farmers, but with some qualifications and reservations. Um, the statutory rules are necessary as a direct, rule, uh, a direct consequence of Brexit, and without these rules, the legislation would not be in place to allow the operation of the existing direct payment scheme for farmers beyond the end of the 2020 scheme. Um, however, it is contextualised, in, uh, particularly with regard to the rural development funds, uh, which have an impact upon the wider rural community, where, as a result of Brexit, 34 million has been lost from previous available funding for rural development over the next three years. And simultaneously, uh, uh, contemporary to that, we have the situation where 15.3 million over the next three years has been lost from the funding to support the bovine TV programme, which is crucial and underpins the functionality of rural communities, particularly so farming communities, and their ability to move on. <clears throat> the payments that we are talking about today are currently worth £293 million, as uh, others have, have said, and they have been the main income support schemes for farmers for many years. And if they ended suddenly, it would be a significant shock for the, the farming industry itself. Um, the fixed ceiling on payments represents a decrease, however, in income in real terms on a yearly basis due to inflation. And now, this is a point, and uh, this is one for the Minister. Uh, we hear the Minister for Finance repeatedly requesting for departments to put forward bids. Uh, is there any potential within this, these regulations that we are now drafting for the Minister to add a supplementary bid for that funding? Which may be available. Just it might be helpful if the minister could clarify that uh, something which could help and assist our rural communities. Um, one particular issue that I did raise at the committee was the the issue of three unsuccessful attempts to the young farmer scheme. Um, now it might be very helpful for the minister to look at that. Ask for some clarity around that. You, you can understand if there are three unsuccessful attempts. Granted, and circumstances have not changed, but circumstances can and do change within the, the business itself, maybe additional farm acquisitions or whatever. So I would like to ask the Minister what provision there is to allow for a change of circumstances application from the same individual or the same business party. Uh, I think it would be important to, to clarify that. Um, I'm not, not talking about multiple repetitive applications on, on the same scheme and the same circumstances, and obviously allowing for those cases where circumstances do and can change. Um, the current level of funding itself has some guarantee attached, but beyond the term of the current UK Parliament, there is no certainty over what will follow for the funding available for direct payments. <clears throat> I think farmers, like most businesses, would ask for certainty and uh, make sure that there is rolling forward uh, a degree of certainty for the, 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 fun the finance and funding which underpins their businesses and the viability of those businesses. Very important for uh, food producers and the agri-food sector. Um, they are also concerned that statute rules are going through in the absence of a broader strategic framework for future agricultural support, specifically for Northern Ireland. I have touched upon some of them already. Uh, there is a need for clear and explicit purpose for future agricultural funding, one that contributes towards the delivery of wider strategic objectives from sustainable farming and land use and done within a sustainable environmental approach too. When uh, or if that will be forthcoming is not clear. 
even before circumstances dictated that the current minister standing in his place here today, um, there have been or has been significant slippage in the target dates for legislation and improved environmental strategies that should already have been before this assembly. I hope we'll see movement on those matters soon. The opportunity is there to use new and existing mechanisms of funding and regulation to combat the global crisis of climate change and ever decreasing biodiversity. What is needed is imagination and the political will to do so. Uh, they hope the Minister, uh, while he's here, uh, will demonstrate both qualities in the time ahead, and I hope, for the best of good reasons, that that will be a short time ahead. Okay, Minister, uh, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. Carmichael, thank you, and I call Rosemary Barton. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to speak in these amendments to the regulations this afternoon. These regulations are the consequence of the UK's withdrawal from the EU and the Common Agricultural Policy. This is one of the most significant changes that will take place in agricultural policy. That will take place in agricultural policy for nearly 50 years. Policies will no longer have to comply with the Common Agricultural Policy, which means that eventually Northern Ireland will be free to develop new approaches and support systems and build on the agri-food industry, which already is recognised as a world-class producer of food. With this new approach, obviously consideration will have to be given to environmental sustainability and improved resilience that address agriculture, the environment and our rural needs. While these amendments to make the direct payments could be described as technical, if these are not in place and not passed, it will affect DERA's ability to make direct payments to farmers and prevent their effective function. Currently, these are worth near approximately £290 million per year to the industry. However, because the Department is constrained by the Treasury, the allocation will not change because the same method to calculate direct payments is made across the United Kingdom. While it will take time to develop policy towards future payments, it's important that there's no impediment to payments. Meanwhile, and prevents simultaneous work towards a review of simplifications for these payments that would be most welcome. Some of, the minor, some of the minor amendments to help with the direct payments include the removal of having to make direct payments through the euro and the removal with non-specific dates together with intended simplification for applicants and administrators of the direct agricultural support schemes. There is also the removal of the greening payment and the money included within the basic farm payment. There is also a new minimum 1% inspection rate for schemes, scheme applications, but this can be increased where necessary by the Department. And finally, there has been provision made to introduce a coupled payment in 2021 for the protein crop payments. Mr. Speaker, I support the motion. Thank you. And as, I, as I introduce the next speaker, can I, can I ask him we please bring the member John Blair into the spotlight, please? Mr. Can I invite John Blair to make your contribution, please? Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I, I want to thank the Minister as well for his uh, opening remarks. May I take the opportunity also, Mr. Speaker, to thank you, your office, the Assembly Secretariat, and uh, all officials in making possible the, this remote access to uh, Assembly debate, following requests from myself, my party colleague Kelly Armstrong, and indeed other members. We are we're grateful for the work done by officials in the interests of members, staff, and of course, public health also. Um, speaking speaking to, to, to the two motions before us, uh, Mr. Speaker, as a member of the Assembly's ERA Committee, I feel it imperative distress from the outset the importance of the agri food sector to the Northern Ireland economy, representing as it does around 10% of activity, which is consider, considerably higher than the overall average of the rest of the UK. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, the profile of the agriculture sector and associated industries here in Northern Ireland varies considerably than those across the UK. The Northern Ireland industry is built around, um, as colleagues will know, quality rather than necessarily scale. 
standards are fundamental and are a matter of pride to all stakeholders right throughout the industry. The United Kingdom leaving the EU and the Common Agricultural Policy is the most significant change in policy affecting the agri-food sector and agriculture in over 40 years. Environmental food safety, animal welfare and labour issues are all now critical consideration when developing new approaches and support systems uh, which need to better address the, the needs of Northern Ireland agriculture, the environment and the rural and, and rural communities. There are also, Mr Speaker, as previously mentioned, a, a broad range of farming and environmental stakeholders who deserve the opportunity to engage more fully in the development of future policy relating to the sector. In Northern Ireland, direct payments, as been pointed out previously, are worth over £293 million annually. Future payments need to support farming and rural communities whilst benefiting the sustainability and profitability of farming and, more crucially, also the environment. It is my hope and the hope of many others that the natural environment and global challenges will feature more heavily and appropriately in future policy shaping. And maybe the Minister will, will reflect on that when, when he responds today. I further hope that the Minister will take an opportunity to, to address the Committee on these range of matters. On behalf of Alliance, I support what is before us to secure continued passage of these regulations, um, which are the subject of both motions. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Blair. And I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We're used to having one John Blair, but to have eight today is certainly more interesting. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, the direct payments to farmers' regulations represents the much-needed continuation of a lifeline of support for the agricultural industry, and I welcome the work done by a department in bringing the regulations before the House today. The regulations will ensure that the relevant legislation is updated to ensure farmers continue to receive support thereby maintaining the status quo. The agricultural industry has experienced a turbulent year, like many other sectors, due to the impacts of COVID-19. The knock-on effects from the closure of hospitality and the difficulties being experienced by the Northern Ireland Protocol, to name but a few, have significantly impacted upon the sector. It is therefore vital that farmers can guarantee the assistance given through the direct payment scheme. The regulations before us today give up much needed certainty and provide the necessary framework for the next scheme year. The Common Agricultural Policy accounted for 79% of the total income of the industry in Northern Ireland between 2013 and 2019. Leaving CAP allows us to chart a new course toward a support system tailored to the needs of the local industry and environment unique to this jurisdiction and adoptable for the future. Last year, payments provided almost $300 million worth of support to the local agricultural sector, a lifeline for many. As I have already stated, unlike CAP, the new scheme affords the opportunity for a flexible and bespoke approach to farming support. It is therefore vital that the Department remembers this for the future that the scope and framework of the scheme are regularly reviewed and that the industry is allowed to play a direct part in this moving forward. We must use our newfound adaptability to our advantage. The Minister recently set out his vision for the future and I welcome the direction of travel he has already outlined. A basic area-based payment that provides a safety net but still encourages productivity. A funding of coupled payments to directly target areas such as suckler cow and breeding ewe producers, and the new agri-environment programme will all work together to incentivise growth and ensure that sustainability is at the heart of agriculture for the years ahead. I welcome the removal of the 3% limit on the increase of the basic payment scheme, which again will provide greater flexibility within the budget allocation. I am also glad to see the retention of the ban on the ploughing our conversion of environmentally sensitive permanent grassland and the increased penalties being provided for in relation to breaches of these prohibitions. I think this sends out a clear message in terms of the importance the Department places on environmental protections. I think this, <coughs> this um, sends out a clear message in terms of the Department places on environmental protections, leaving 
the cap allows us to remove many of the constraints placed on our environmental programmes and I look forward to further changes in this area being progressed. The changes provided for will give legal effect to a range of simplifications and improvements announced for the 2021 scheme year by the Minister in September, and I support both motions. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Emma Sheeran. Or Emma, or Carl, Emma Sheeran. I welcome the opportunity today to speak on the Direct Payments to Farmers Regulations um, Amendment and Simplifications and to support them being as they are the removal of a barrier to continue direct payments beyond 2020. At the outset, we must acknowledge that these SRs offer nothing more than short-term breathing space. They allow single farm payments to continue, but they offer absolutely no assurances to our local farmers about what they can expect to earn going forward, given that we have now been dragged out of the EU against the expressed wishes of the majority of the population here in the North. EU-funded direct payments, as has already been outlined, are currently worth over £293 million to our agricultural producers in the North. Every year, EU payments constitute 87% of our farmers' total income. So when our farming community told us loudly and clearly that Brexit would be bad for agriculture, they were not exaggerating. The Tories have previously promised that direct payments will continue until the end of the current mandate, but you'll forgive our local farmers for not relaxing based on the word of the British government alone. Their inability to keep it is something that I know my colleagues across the benches are now acutely aware of. Uncertainty and confusion are the common themes amongst our rural populations currently. Remember, this just doesn't affect the people lambing the sheep or planting potatoes. It's our farming community who support the machinery dealers, the scanning and clipping and fencing contractors, the vets, the family businesses putting up sheds and concrete and yards, the small agri shops selling lime and fertilizer, diesel and feed. When we're on the subject of single farm payment, I think it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge the double blow that was dealt to our mountain farmers in the wake of the Brexit decision. Minister, your department failed in its obligation to rural communities this time last year when your predecessor refused to acknowledge the will of this House and overturn your party colleague's decision to stop ANC funding to hill farmers. Not only did you overturn the decision made by my colleague Michelle O'Neill to recognise the additional challenges faced by hill farmers and compensate them accordingly, but you also put an end to the transition towards a flat rate which she had implemented in a bid to create equality between all farmers, ensuring that hill farmers were no longer punished for poor soil quality. Unlike those who might avail of the protein crop payment that you have referred to now, mountain farmers don't have a range of choices for their, for their land. What you and successive DUP ministers have failed to understand, Minister, is that hill farming without the ANC element, without an increased entitlement value, is not viable. This is driving livestock off our hills instead of encouraging them onto it. We need to get money into the pockets of our hard-pressed farmers. Encouraging closed stocks and allowing our farmers to rear the lambs and calves from birth ensures traceability and reduces the risk of disease. To act like the old model was production-based ignores the vital contribution our hill farmers make towards our local food chain. And as someone who has grown up in a farming family and has seen firsthand the energy and effort a farm consumes, I call it nothing short of an insult. Farming is a labour of love without none of which would survive. At a time when we are turning towards an all-Ireland economy, when the sensible option for producer and consumer alike is to trade within the country, to go up the road or down of it instead of in crossing water, it makes absolutely no sense that our farmers in the north are now going to be at a disadvantage because their counterparts in the 26 counties can still avail of common agricultural policy funding, but they can't. My uncles in Donegal can get this, my dad in Tyrone can't. Another group who are losing out as a result of Brexit, who have been failed by your department minister, are the Loch Ness fishing community. Despite repeated promises from as far back as last September, when your predecessor Edwin Putz, both in written format and in this chamber, told me that they would receive the COVID-19 compensation package that they were promised, that other producers received, the fishing operators in Loch Ness are still without support. We are a year into this pandemic, Minister, and this is not acceptable. I welcome these regulations and I hope for a change in attitude from the Department of Agriculture so as to see money going back into rural communities. Gormagat. Gormagat, thank you. And I call Philip McGuigan. Margaret, I can call you. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak uh, to the, the debate today on these SRs, uh, and the first one being the direct payment to farmers. Uh, 
As a result of Brexit, the North is uh, obviously now out of the common agricultural policy. These SRs on direct payment amendment regulations will ensure the delivery of direct agricultural payments to farmers uh, for this year, 2021. I sit in the, the Agriculture, and Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, and the SR was considered on the 4th of February. Uh, the con committee, as has already been said by others, was, was more or less content on the policy. The SR maintains the status quo, and the amendments introduced are merely technical in nature. It outlines how DEER will continue to determine the annual financial ceiling uh, and calculate payments beyond 2021. Uh, it won't be set in legislation, which means we will uh, have to align with Treasury allocation. There are no policy changes with the SR, uh, and farmers uh, should not see any changes as a result. The second SR on uh, simplification regulations again was considered at the, the committee on 4 February. It makes simpli simplifications, changes, improvements to direct agriculture payment schemes for uh, the incoming year in a number of ways, removing green uh, requirements, maintaining uh, the ban on ploughing or conversion of environmentally sensitive permanent grassland, basic uh, payment scheme land elig eligibility inspection rate is now set at 1%, uh, and the development of future schemes will be the responsibility of DERA and not uh, DEFRA, among other things. So, uh, as has already been outlined, if there was concerns raised about the reduction of inspections to 1% at DERA uh, officials did uh, address these concerns. The proposed reduction uh, will only apply to land eligibility and not to cross-compliance measures. Uh, and it was explained that due to COVID, inspection rates had to be reduced to 1% uh, for basic payment schemes and 3% for greening payments. And due to greening requirements being removed, only 1% of inspections uh, for basic payment scheme will be carried forward for the incoming in year. So officials told us that this provides adequate control after conducting assessments. So, I mean, Sinn Féin will be supporting both SRs. We do, uh, though, however, note that this uh, cover is only for the incoming year only. Uh, instead, so we have an annual budget, not the seven-year multi-annual budget framework previously under the Common Agricultural Policy pillars uh, of one and two. So, whilst there is commitment in the Tory government manifesto to retain direct agricultural payment until the end of uh, the British Parliament, there are no guarantees. Uh, after that date, and uh, has already been pointed out by others, the fact that the British government have appealed the fixed-term parliament. We actually don't know what the situation is going to be like beyond 2022. Our farmers uh, and our rural community uh, will undoubtedly face major uncertainty. Uh, our neighbours in the south do remain in the common agricultural policy, and as has been said, you know this will or could lead to an uneven playing field on this island uh, and pose problems to uh, farmers here in the north and, and, and our ability to compete with farmers uh, across the island. So, whilst I support the SRs, there are major issues and concerns that our farmers have hanging over them and that we will no doubt be raising in this chamber in the future. Thank you. And I call Claire Bailey. Thank you. Speakers, uh, speakers sorry, one of you, just the seventh of Jones. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But we've been repeatedly assured um, that these SRs are mainly technical amendments to how direct payments were previously administered, and for that reason, we will be supporting um, these today. Um, and the, the simplifications, we're told, are broadly um, well. We certainly in the, in the Green Party broadly welcome them because we welcome the ability for payments to continue into 2021, providing that limited certainty for farmers. It is important that minor simplifications do not become characteristic of the change that we make to our system of agricultural payments as we leave the EU and the common agricultural policy. Instead, there must, these must be part of a transition period, continuing towards delivering better outcomes for both nature and land use and the wider farming sector through nature-friendly farming models. Because as it stands, England is currently working on its new system of direct payments. They are using public money for public goods model, which does not automatically extend to Northern Ireland. And we know that Scotland and Wales are working on their own bespoke primary legislation for 2024. And we know that the EU level, the cap itself, is being reformed. Is Northern Ireland being left behind? As we know, 
despite clear support from the ERA committee at the time for such a provision that no sunset clause for Northern Ireland was included in the UK Agriculture Act. And we know that without the legal obligation to introduce our own bespoke NI Agriculture Bill, change will be slow in coming. And we know we are in a situation where no such legislation seems to be forthcoming and there has been no indication that such legislation will ever be forthcoming. For all we know, this simplification regime will simply continue indefinitely. What we need is for these simplification payments to be part of a time-limited transition period until we get our own le legislation in place for farmers. It is essential to provide this certainty to farmers and to the agri-food sector at large. So I'm calling upon the Minister to make the creation of Northern Ireland's own Agriculture Act a priority. There can be no doubt that the future of agriculture policy is at a crossroads. Our system is at breaking point. Where at one hand we see an industry that has become increasingly hostile to those at its heart. Rural poverty is at an all-time high and one in four farming families live in poverty. And on the other hand, we see our natural ecosystems in a state of collapse. Government policies of agricultural intensification that have led to 98% of our special areas of conservation exceeding their critical thresholds for ammonia pollution. And we have no air pollution strategy either. 95% of our lakes fail water framework directive quality standards. At the same time, our agriculture sector is the sector with the biggest contribution to our total greenhouse gas emissions. So I don't think the track record, as mentioned before, on environmental sustainability is really there. As tricky an issue as it is, the issue of climate change is one that must be addressed. We need to get working out a transition plan for rural communities, as well as the rest of us. The writing has been on the wall about climate change all this time, and it cannot be ignored. Business, as usual, is not an option. And we keep hearing about plans from the minister and the department on this new green growth strategy, a strategy based on more productivity. But we haven't had sight of it to date. We haven't seen the detail. But we must move forward with the Northern Ireland Agriculture Act using the public money for public good model that puts nature and farmers at its heart. Any future system must address farm poverty, must support small farmers, and must improve the status of farmers in the value chain, while also mitigating against the effects of climate change, improving our water quality, our air quality, and protecting and enhancing biodiversity. The Green Party do not believe this to be ridiculous nor impossible. We will do all we can to make what some may believe to be impossible very possible. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and we'll support the SRs today. Thank you. And I now call on the Minister of Agriculture and Environment and Rural Affairs, Gordon Lyons, Minister. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank all of those members who have made uh, contributions today. Uh, together, these are important statutory rules that will ensure the continued smooth delivery of direct agricultural support uh, to farmers. And I want to welcome uh, the fact that we did have support within the uh, committee, and uh, it appears throughout uh, the chamber today as well. Um, for these regulations, which has been noted, is, is essential. And to begin with, I would like to thank the chairman of the committee for uh, acknowledging um, that and for uh, rehearsing the, the view um, of the committee and putting that uh, on the record. Uh, we did get, though, then to his own um, party political uh, contribution, a very party political uh, contribution, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to uh, speak to a few of the issues that he had uh, raised. And first of all, he mentioned a number um, of strategies and, and frameworks that he is um, looking for, for clarification on. We had um, talk of climate change and ammonia and rural frameworks and, and, and TB, and those are all uh, progressing. And I do hope to have more information uh, uh, with the committee soon in, in relation to what the department uh, is doing. And he had mentioned a TB, 
and uh, the lack of action uh, so far uh, on TB. I can confirm that is, this is something that I am pushing uh, in my short time in office. Uh, it is my expectation that something um, will be happening uh, this year and that we will see interventions take place uh, this year. And I hope that that will be welcomed. Um, though I would remind the member that from 2007 until 2016, it was his own party that held the post that I am currently in. Where was the progress during that time? And where was the progress during the three years when there was no assembly, when it was his party that kept the assembly, done, uh, kept the assembly down, preventing us from taking action not only uh, on, uh, uh, in a second, not only from TB, uh, but on a number uh, of other issues uh, across many, many departments. Now, I wouldn't want to test the patience of the Speaker too much in relation to this, but I'm happy to give away to the member. Um, on the topic of TB, um, does the member accept that it was the, the TVR study which was implemented by the former Dard Minister, Michelle Neal, a very, very wide-ranging study which will, in fact, underpin whatever interventions he will finally eventually put in place to tackle this here issue? And of course, we will be looking at all of those options, and I hope that, as I said, that an intervention will take place um, this year. Um, but there hasn't been the movement that we would have liked on this over the past number of years, uh, and I'm glad um, that, because of the work that my predecessor um, and, and the, the work that I am doing, that this issue um, can be uh, moved on. I thank other members for their, uh, for their comments um, they have made. Um, Mr Irwin um, uh, outlined that the reason why uh, we need to have these regulations uh, in place and the importance of them. And I thank him and uh, Mrs Barton as well for welcoming the fact that we now have opportunities as a result of leaving the EU to tailor support that we're not now having to um, find our way into this one-size-fits-all one model from the EU, but we now have the ability um, to make sure that we can tailor support to our own needs here uh, in Northern Ireland. Just to respond to um, the concerns that Mr McGlone um, had raised um, in relation to um, the unsuccessful applications and, and the, the limit of three uh, on that now, uh, it, it is of course the case that they will be able to make a number of applications and circumstances may change. Uh, within that, and, and they are still able to, to apply again and have those three attempts uh, to do that. Um, however, if through the implementation of this revised uh, approach, if difficulties are, are to be identified, uh, then we can look at this again uh, in the coming years. However, the evidence that we have is that this will affect a relatively small number of people, if any. So uh, I think it is important we have that ability to change if necessary, um, but it is good that these changes are put in place and that these rules uh, are put in place. He also mentioned certainty uh, in terms of the future and, and the supposed certainty that he felt that he had within the uh, European Union. Of course, that certainty didn't uh, exist. There were limits um, uh, in terms of the support, uh, in terms of the time frame. Nothing was guaranteed beyond 2023. 20, uh, uh, and now we have the power to support farmers the way that we want and that we desire. And I think that that uh, should be welcomed as well. Uh, Mr Blair had also raised a number of questions in relation to what future uh, support might look like. Again, this is now in our, our own hands, but as Minister Putz had outlined in his statement to the Assembly back in uh, November time, uh, we want to, to progress, taking into consideration uh, a, a number of issues. We want to increase uh, productivity, we want to see improved resilience, uh, a more integrated supply chain, and also being environmentally sustainable. Those are the um, issues on which we will build our, our future support and our future uh, policy uh, as we move forward in the coming uh, months and years. Uh, there was um, also concerns um, that were raised in, uh, by, by Ms Sheeran in relation to uh, areas of natural uh, constraint. I can confirm uh, to the member that I have no plans uh, to reintroduce uh, an ANC measure. This is an old cap uh, measure that has little to offer in terms of moving the industry uh, forward. And we, look, we need to look to the future rather than try uh, to recreate uh, the past. Um, that is my position, that is the position um, of uh, my uh, predecessor uh, as well. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to give away in just a second. Um, that is our uh, position moving forward, and I hope um, that it would be understood that we need to, to change how we uh, provide that support uh, in the future, putting it where it's needed, and, and support being made available for all farmers.
to go Minister, um, you said that this is, is not wanted by a majority, but a majority in this House supported a motion that was brought forward on the ANC payment just last year within this mandate. So it's, it might be the DUP's view that the ANC payment is, is not something that works, but that's at odds with the rest of the Assembly. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that um, we're on, on different sides um, on this. I don't think that that's going to change uh, today either. I note the comments that she has made, but certainly in, in my engagement with farmers uh, and stakeholders, um, this is not what I see. Or not, not what I'm being told is the way forward. It's not what people want to see uh, progressed. And instead, we should focus our efforts on devising schemes and support measures uh, that are for the good of uh, all farmers. Um, Mr. Speaker, I think those were all the comments that were directly related to the regulations that we have in front of us uh, today. And given the importance of the issue, as I have set out, uh, I would commend the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you. And the question is that the draft direct payments to farmers amendment regulations NI 2021 be approved. All those in favour say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We will now move on to the second motion on the draft, direct payments to farmers' regulations, which have already been debated. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. Please read the motion. That the draft direct payments to farmers' simplification or simplifications regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Thank you. And I call the minister to move the motion. I'd like to move. Thank you. And the question is that the draft direct payment to farmers simplifications regulations NI 2021 be approved. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Could members please take a raise for a moment or two? Of order, Mr. Butler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you would know that the right to vote is a democratic right that is cherished and protected across the world and here in Northern Ireland. That right to vote is protected in legislation, as are the mechanisms to facilitate that right, and the absolute need to ensure the register of voters is as up to date and accurate as possible. Last week, Sinn Féin, a party in this assembly, which is led by the Deputy First Minister, produced what I can only describe as a package of misinformation and fake news with regard to the updating of the register and the electoral office for Northern Ireland will soon embark on. Surely it's incumbent on each of us as elected representatives of this assembly and our parties to uphold democratic process, accuracy, openness and transparency, and as such, can I ask the Speaker's office to investigate and rule on this matter? 
I think the member should be aware that that is not a point of order, but the member has put his points on the record. And now comes the next slide. Uh, <coughs> point of order. Mr. Mr. Speaker, would the Speaker's office look at how members are using points of order, which are really to press releases and for snapshots in this evening's news? Could the Speaker's office please look at that, please? Um, your, your comments will be on the record, and they are valid that they should be investigated. Uh, and I'm sure that that will be drawn to the attention of the Speaker. Okay. The next item of business uh, on the order paper is a motion on a recovery and investment strategy. I'll ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly recognises the deep and lasting impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on people, communities and businesses across Northern Ireland, further recognises the severe impact that restrictions have had on our society and economy, and the devastating impact that the conclusion of the furlough scheme will have on jobs, regrets that the Minister for the Economy and Minister of Finance have failed to produce a comprehensive COVID-19 recovery plan, prioritising employment and efforts to build back better, expresses concern that the Minister for the Economy has failed to outline a strategy for maximising the potential for job creation and growth as a result of dual market access guaranteed under the Protocol in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and calls on both ministers to work with their executive colleagues to establish a comprehensive recovery and investment strategy that will transform public services, create more jobs, and help build back better from the crisis. I call Sinead McLaughlin to move the motion. I beg to move the motion. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. I now invite you to open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This Assembly has a choice. We can moan about the situation we face, or we can get on with it and fix it. The SDLP has always focused on solutions, and we are proud of that. And my does Northern Ireland need solutions today? This is not just about COVID. We also have other very major challenges. We have Brexit and we have climate change. We can spend our time arguing about whose fault it is, or we can devise solutions. And in doing so, we have the opportunity to begin to solve the deep-seated problems in our society. Perhaps the biggest problem of all is inequality. That inequality has been manifest throughout the pandemic. COVID-19 has not hit people equally. Those who are poor, those who live in overcrowded accommodation, those who do not have access to private health care, those who work in the National Health Service and the caring professions, workers in low-paid service jobs, and those whose local neighbourhoods have air quality blighted by traffic and solid fuel burning. Those, along with the old, are the people most likely to become seriously ill with COVID-19 and who are most likely to die. So the crisis of COVID-19 is also a crisis of inequality. And of course, the SDLP was founded to address inequality in our society. So as we look to build back better, it is essential that we correct the deep-seated inequalities in our society here in Northern Ireland. But if we just let market forces do their work, we won't achieve a better and a fairer society. About one in five workers who have been on furlough for the past six months or more are expected to lose their jobs. Last year, some 11,000 intended redundancies were notified by employers. The situation is likely to worsen this year, affecting in particular our young adults, the lowest paid, those in zero-hour contracts, and others who have the weakest positions within the labour market. This is particularly true for those without strong skills that are valued most by employers. For generations, our labour market has struggled with insufficient skills delivering productivity levels that are the worst in the UK. 
So if we are to have an effective recovery from COVID, it is essential we raise the skill levels across our working age population. The solution must start in our schools. We must address inefficiencies and inadequate provisions within our further education and our higher education colleges. The COVID recovery plan must involve all our government departments, breaking down the silo system of government that prevails in this executive. It would, sorry, no time. It would be wrong to try to just re re recreate the structure of the economy we had before the pandemic. When talking about building back better, we need to take this literally, not just metaphorically. Prior to the pandemic, we already had a crisis in our high streets and towns and city centres. Our retail centres must be centres of leisure activity. We need to invest more in our streetscapes, our green spaces, making city and town centres easy places to walk around with less crowded pavements, allowing cafes and restaurants to expand and spill outside. They need to be recaptured as places for people not dominated by cars. Central to the economy minister's approach is the circulated paper called Rebuilding a Stronger Economy, which includes a section on a more regionally balanced economy. It talks about how to bring rural areas up to the level of the urban areas. Yet the biggest challenge of all is how do we bring the weakest urban areas up to the level of the strongest urban areas? If you look at the maps of deprivation, of joblessness, right across the north, you will see clearly where the biggest problems of regional imbalance are. They are in Derry and in Strabane, in West Belfast and North Belfast. The apparent failure of the Ministers for the Economy and of Finance to recognise that reality shows a real lack of perspective behind the decision-making process when considering how to build back better. Talking about a lack of perspective, brings me to the protocol. No one dislikes or opposes Brexit more than me. But even I can see that the Brexit protocol provides the North with new opportunities that we must grasp. I recognise that sadly Order. there are some who are so blinded by their narrow ideology that they would prefer to suffer than use the opportunities that they have. But that is not the attitude of the SDLP. My colleague Matthew O'Toole and I have written to the Economy Minister to urge her to fully exploit the advantages that we now have as a result of the protocol, while of course working pragmatically to reduce oh, the difficulties order, order caused members. by Brexit order, and the order. East West. Please take trade. your seat. Okay. Please take your seat. Okay. Members, we are at the start of the debate. You all will have an opportunity to give your point of view. If you wish to intervene, you can ask, and if it's allowed, that will be permitted. Other than that, wait until your turn. There's too much noise from a sedentary position. Call the Speaker. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. My colleague Matthew O'Toole and I have written to the Economy Minister to urge her to fully exploit the advantages that we now have as a result of protocol, while, of course, working pragmatically to reduce the difficulties caused by Brexit and the East-West trade. We wrote to Intertrade Ireland, to the IDA, to Invest NI, to the UK Department of International Trade to also urge them to exploit the opportunities pre pre presented by the protocol. And I want to pay tribute here, and this is not something I will say very often, to Invest NI. This is an occasion that I have this is an organisation that I have criticised on many occasions because of its lack of regional balance. But I absolutely have no criticism of Invest ANI with regard to the protocol. I'd like to quote from Invest ANI, and I realise this will be difficult for some people to hear. But this is what they have said. This dual market access position means that Northern Ireland can become a gateway for the sale of goods to two of the world's largest market and the only place where businesses can operate free from custom declarations, rules of origin certificates and non-tariff barriers on the sale of goods to both GB 
and the EU. This is a unique proposition for manufacturers based in Northern Ireland, as well as those seeking a pivotal location from which to service GB and EU markets, recalibrate supply chains, or design, develop and sell products across, across key industries, such as life and health sciences, aerospace, electronics and machinery, chemicals, consumer and agri-food products. I totally concur, however, but I would have added uh, renewable energies as I think th um, the, uh, it would help those producers reliant on it as well. That brings us to the other problem um, that has been inflicted upon us, and that is climate change and the necessity to decarbonise our economy. Imagine a place with lots of hills where wind turbines can generate massive amounts of electricity. Imagine a place with lots of coastline that provides the opportunity for tidal strength to be converted into electricity. Imagine, too, a place internationally recognised as having substantial levels of geothermal heat underground that can be used to heat buildings. That place members is Northern Ireland. But imagine too a place where four out of ten homes are occupied by people in fuel poverty. Imagine as well a place where hundreds of thousands of homes are leaking heat because the properties are in serious need of major improvements to their energy efficiency. This represents a massive challenge for our ability to move to 100% net zero by 2050. These facts make the case for a Green New Deal, a core part of the policies of my party. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let us put the pieces together, improving our city and town centres, giving them new purpose with more, more urban living, leisure facilities and green spaces, creating substantial jobs in the construction industry, reskilling our work force for those out of work and for those not yet in work for the next generation of jobs, investing in infrastructure including public transport, water supplies and sewerage, accelerating broadband rollout, exploiting the Brexit protocol to attract inward investment and support local businesses to make good on the best of both worlds, helping local producers to supply to, supply to local retailers, regional imbalance, or imbalance requiring Invest NI to promote jobs right across the north, particularly in areas with the highest unemployment rates, such as Derry. Delivering more and spreading more fairly higher education places and skills training. Decarbonising the close. economy, supporting the rollout of heat pumps, hydrogen, promoting hydrogen, implementing a Green New Deal and creating a more equal society. Mr Deputy Speaker, once you put these elements together, Members you genuinely have a comprehensive recovery and investment strategy, the members time unlike the weak proposals up. put forward by the Minister for the Economy. Order, and order. The Member's time Thank is you. up, and I now call Kiva Archibald. Am I moving? Move the amendment. Moved. You will have 10 minutes to move the amendment and a further five minutes to wind. And I invite you to formally uh, uh, introduce your amendment. Thank you, Las Cancorlia. And, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to contribute to today's debate and to move our amendment. And our amendment was made in the spirit of the recognition of the need for a collective approach from the executive to the recovery from COVID-19. Clearly, we face many challenges in the weeks and months ahead, as hopefully in the not too distant future, if we continue on the right track, restrictions will begin to ease and society will begin to reopen. This has been a devastating year and everyone here will recognise first and foremost it has had a devastating human cost, with many people losing loved ones and others suffering serious and long-lasting health impacts. But it has also had a huge negative impact on our way of life and on livelihoods. Businesses have had to close and for some people their jobs disappeared overnight while tens of thousands of people remain on furlough, uncertain about their futures. Certainly, the interventions from both the British government and the executive have been vital in mitigating the worst impact and helping businesses to survive and protect jobs. However, despite all the interventions, there do remain those who have been excluded from support schemes to date, and that still needs to be addressed. There remains £250 million of funding which can be allocated to support businesses and protect jobs, but there has been a frustrating lack 
of um, any new schemes coming forward, and I would ask the Economy Minister to look at that again, including for those self-employed people who fall between the self-employed income support scheme and the newly self-employed scheme, for those travel agents who have been very badly impacted and need particular supports, and for the events sector which have not had any specific support either. While there is money available, it should be utilised to help as many businesses and workers as possible. The Finance Minister, very quickly. If the previous debate in the economy, the lady from Foyle thought it very funny that I pointed out the massive debt that government is running up. The member now knows, because the minister has revealed, every week of lockdown is costing the Northern Ireland economy £100 million. Would you like to talk to that? I'm not sure if you were referring to myself. I'm not from Foyle. Oh. <laughs> Order. Um, however, it's, I, I, I think that what we have seen from governments around the world is the massive state intervention, which shows the strength and importance of that. And that is something that we do need to look at going forward. Um, and I think that what we, we do want to see is a continued economic and fiscal stimulus to support businesses and to get our recovery and our economic recovery in particular on track. And just to bring it back to, to, my, to my remarks, I think all of us here recognise the importance of the furlough scheme and the need for it to be extended further to continue to support businesses and particularly those most impacted and those that won't return to anything like normal operations for some time. And another possible cliff edge and last minute dot com announcement is not going to be helpful to any business trying to plan and support their workers. The ongoing cost to businesses who have not yet been able to open and haven't been able to open for the past year is something the British Treasury needs to look at again in respect of the furlough scheme. The pandemic has lasted longer than what many of us originally thought, longer restrictions, and there's been a need for mitigations rather than stimuli for recovery. And it's clear that that's going to continue for some time. But there is a need to plan for the way forward, to ensure that we are ready to boost a recovery once we are through the worst of this, and that we don't simply return to what we were doing before. Because let's face it, it wasn't working too well anyway. We have a very poor economic scorecard, and that needs to change. We also need to respond to the new trading reality that has resulted from Brexit. Our businesses and our communities need to be supported to deal with the challenges posed by Brexit and to build on the protections afforded by the protocol and the continuing access to the EU single market. We need to seek collective leadership to find solutions within the arrangements of the protocol and to support businesses who, because of Brexit, have greater challenges. And this includes support to reorientate supply chains and markets across the island of Ireland. But recovery from COVID-19, even the economic recovery, won't fall to one department to deliver. It needs to be an executive strategy with buy-in from all ministers. We need to work to tackle deprivation and break down barriers to education and employment. We need to ensure our recovery from COVID-19 seriously addresses the threats from the climate and biodiversity crises. We need to have a holistic approach that cuts across all departments to de deliver a jobs-led recovery skills and employability programmes, entrepreneur supports, building on the new ways of working that we have had to adopt and accept being accelerated throughout the pandemic, creating a more regionally balanced economy where our towns, villages and cities are more suited to contemporary working, living and socialising, with infrastructure to support modern living, which is increasingly digital and online, as well as a transport network which meets the needs of our rural and urban communities and also delivers on our decarbonisation targets. None of these things will be done in isolation. So that's why our amendment calls on the executive to develop a comprehensive recovery and investment strategy. The pandemic has shone a bright light on many of the inequalities and structural problems, particularly on the importance of our public services, which have been decimated by a decade of Tory austerity. It has also highlighted the real essential workers, and we need to remember this as we plan the way forward. Sinn Féin published our economic recovery strategy back in June last year. It was based on four key principles. Supporting workers and their families, including through ensuring we deliver on the protections for workers committed to in New Decade New Approach. Supporting businesses to create and sustain jobs through skills programmes, start-up supports and the infrastructure to support local recovery across the North. Delivering on a just transition to a net zero carbon society because as we move away from the reliance on fossil fuels, we need to ensure those who can afford at least aren't left footing the bill. And finally, giving the executive the financial tools to deliver on recovery, 
because being at the whim of a Tory Chancellor who delivers funding for COVID supports in dribs and drabs and who fail to live up to the commitment of multi-annual budgets isn't the way to plan for economic recovery. There needs to be a real conversation about the financial and borrowing tools the Executive needs to be able to deliver in terms of economic recovery. Those four principles are the basis of a strategy which should be delivered across the Executive, a strategy that aligns our programme for government with all ministers and to all departments working to deliver on their important roles within it. Certainly that is the approach which is envisaged through the outcomes-based approach programme for government, which is focused on indicators that don't fall neatly into departmental boxes. It is about an approach which is breaking down departmental silos and ensuring better outcomes for all our citizens. All those parties who are in the executive need to pull their weight. They need to show they are serious about collective leadership and responsibility by contributing to the development of the recovery strategy and then to driving it forward. Building back better can't just be an aspiration or a slogan. It needs to be delivered on, and that means having a strategy that isn't just a document on the shelf, but is a, the act of work of the programme for government for all ministers and all departments. I call Christopher Stelford. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to indicate that we will not be supporting the motion, but we will be uh, supporting the amendment. Um, Mr Speaker, I think everyone recognises the serious impact that lockdown measures have had, not only on an economic level, but at a societal level. As I said earlier in my intervention to the Chair of the Economy Committee, this is costing the Northern Ireland economy £100 million per week. And we have seen projections that up to 100,000 jobs are likely to be lost in Northern Ireland. Now, in that context, it is well and good to table motions demanding recovery plans and greater action from one or two government ministers, whilst at the same time, week in, week out, day in, day out, appearing in the media to demand that lockdowns should continue. Now, you cannot therefore have it both ways. You cannot, every time the Education Minister is in this chamber, lambast him for daring to suggest the opening of schools. You cannot appear uh, on, in the media and in the press opposing even a hint of the slightest easement of lockdowns and then bring motions such as this in front of the Assembly. I'm happy to if I get an extra minute. Do I get an extra minute if I give way? If there's an intervention. Knock yourself out. <laughs> I leave, leave that to you. If, uh, um, uh, would the member agree with me? His, his argument seems to be that there's this binary between opening up the economy and uh, you know, between, between locking down and this magical opening up of the economy. Basically, every independent economic forecaster and a serious analyst around the world doesn't accept that binary. We can't simply open up the economy when the virus is still rampant. It would do more economic damage. And the real thing we should be doing is vaccinating as many people as possible, driving the infection down, because that's the way to economic recovery. Members, give, way and I, uh, give way, and I don't take the entire minute. Um, I'm not suggesting that for a second, but what I am pointing out is that Northern Ireland is one of the most locked down places in the world. And in terms of controlling access to education, closing off huge swathes of our economy and all of the resultant uh, trouble that will come from that. So I think it's important. I, I, don't, I, I think that we should be doing everything in our power to get the economy opened up as quickly as possible within the constraints of the, the, the situation, the public health situation that confronts us. But I have noticed that even when that is hinted at or suggested, certain parties uh, run to the TV studios to absolutely rubbish the suggestion. And the same ones who are demanding almost eternal lockdown will be the ones coming along and tabling motions like this, singling out the Minister for the Economy and the Minister for Finance. I think people can see that as, as quite cynical behaviour and can see straight through it. Um, the economy is everything because it pays for all of the public sector. It pays for all of the services that we want uh, to provide for our constituents. So it's only through having a strong and thriving economic situation that we can pay for roads, that we can pay for hospitals, that we can pay for schools. And therefore, we must be cognizant of that fact. Yes, of course, health is important. 
the economy is equally important. I, I'm so, uh, yeah, go on ahead. Would, would the member accept that there are parties opposite and what they would like is a continual drip feeding, as we heard from the Chancellor, without any recognition of where real money comes from? And, and that is the point. These are debts that will be run up that will have to be paid back. And it's not real money, it's borrowed money. So I think we do need to uh, be cognizant of that. Uh, in terms of the, the, the comments of the section of the motion, that relates to uh, the benefits of the protocol. The benefits of this protocol are as illusory a concept as that of European Union flexibility. Um, there are no benefits to the protocol. It adds costs to customers. It adds costs to businesses. It makes it harder to operate a business in this part of the world. And those who argued, I noticed, Mr Deputy Speaker, the tone has now changed. Gone is rigorous implementation of the protocol as the consequence of what they campaigned for has become more and more obvious to businesses and to consumers. Rigorous, cam rigorous implementation has been changed to uh, teething problems. They're now teething problems. They're not teething problems. This is what the protocol was designed to do designed to punish the people of Northern Ireland, either if they're trying to purchase goods or if they're trying to operate a business. Indeed, I recall in a previous debate, my colleague, Mr O'Toole, thanked the EU for giving us the protocol. Thank you for making it harder for my constituents to purchase goods. Thank you for making it more expensive to run a business. Thank you for your uh, benign attitude toward us. I think the vaccine debacle demonstrated to all of us just how benign and decent the view of the European Union is towards Northern Ireland. We're nothing more than a plaything for them to use in terms of getting back at the rest of the United Kingdom for voting to leave. Solutions must begin in schools. Previous, uh, the introducer of the, the motion said, I absolutely agree with that. That's why schools should the member draws remain the close. I will, sure. That's why schools shouldn't remain closed forever. And as quickly as we can get schools and institutions of learning open, the better for everyone. Thank you. I call John Stewart. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I wasn't expecting to get in so soon. Um, say I want to thank the proposer and the, um, the proposer of the amendment as well for bringing this today. I think there was a similar motion back in October, and unfortunately things haven't moved on very much since. We're still in lockdown. Businesses are still under pressure, and the economy is suffering. As a, res as a result of that. I do share the frustrations about, um, to date, a lack of a clear economic pathway, and I share the need for an ambitious, innovative and cross-cutting economic strategy, and I do recognise the need for the entire executive to play the role within that. I think we all should be concerned about the impacts of furlough ending, and no one should be under any illusions about the impact that could have if it ends too soon, even if that is in a targeted way. Uh, that being said, it is important to recognise just the huge levels of government intervention, both from Her Majesty's Treasury and from the Stormont Executive, that have helped to shore up businesses and to provide a safety net for workers. Um, we can only imagine the true horrific impact that we would have had without that. There is, Mr Deputy Speaker, thankfully light at the end of the tunnel. There is a excellent vaccination programme being rolled out, as we've been discussing already, and hopefully um, we'll be out of lockdown and we will start to see the economic recovery come in very soon. There is a current document being worked um, through by the Department of Economy that was published back in June last year, which is Rebuilding a Strong Economy. And Previously, the Minister knew that I was uh, somewhat critical of that because in the medium-term strategy and recovery strategy that it tends to address, it had the same three cornerstones that every economic strategy has ever had of creating highly paid jobs, developing highly skilled and agile workforce, and rebalancing the um, regional economy. I don't think anybody could be against any of those things and think that's what we should be aspirational from, but I just could never understand how that could fit into a 12- to 18-month strategy. It was just going to be almost unachievable that we'd ever have got to that stage. Um, we do we, um, eagerly await the publication of the Northern Ireland Economic Recovery Plan, and we understand from last week that £160 million has been bid for that. But I do hope that it includes recognition of our micro and small business sectors, which make up over 90% of our economy. I do hope it recognises the need to grow our social economy through a Social Enterprise Act, um, with a no um, also looking at potentially a Northern Ireland first public procurement process and a focus on skills and jobs. 
um, an ambitious attempt to promote and grow our fintech and green energy sectors, and also on town centre regenerations, which have been under major pressure since well before the pandemic broke out. We often talk that, Northern, uh, that governments don't create jobs, but the businesses do when given the right conditions to do so. And there was a scheme that was launched um, here briefly, um, which was a reincarnation of the um, scheme launched by Westminster, the Kickstart scheme, and that was the Job Start scheme. And I find it uh, almost impossible to believe that just three months after that was launched and tinkered with by the Department of Communities, that that has now been binned. Young people who've returned from studying in GB or Ireland or Republic of Ireland have come back wanting to get on the apprenticeship or onto uh, a paid internship are now being told that that scheme is no longer available. How can we say, on one hand, that we want to invest in our most important asset, our people, at the same time give them, uh, throw them a lifeline and then take it away just whenever the opportunity is about to begin? Businesses have been in touch with me. Dozens of young people who are, were meant to start into that scheme um, have been in touch with me just to say that they are completely disgusted that it has been removed for the sake of £16 million. And it would be a message to the Minister for Communities and to the Minister for Finance as well. Refund that scheme. Get it back up and running. Like I say, we talk about our young people being our most important asset. I just cannot for the life of me understand how that has been withdrawn for the sake of £16 million. And I, I just think that the opportunities it would create, specifically in the sectors that it wants to work in, would be, would be absolutely massive. And we talk about the brain drain here and about the impacts that that is having and how many young people are leaving when that scheme was there to target exactly that. So please, if we could get that through as a cross-cutting strategy within the executive, I'd love to see it. Um, finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, the motion refers to the benefits of the protocol, and I have to say I want to see the Department actually focusing on the impacts right now of the protocol, rather than aspirationally job creation, if that's something that others think might happen. Right now, businesses in my constituency are massively under the cosh. They cannot get goods in. They are struggling with their logistics. They are paying more, some twice, twice for their tariffs. So I would actually encourage the Minister to set up a designated point within her department to catalogue the hundreds of issues that businesses here are raising to try and work towards solutions Member for them, because these are the businesses who are working and operating right now, and they need solutions as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, as members will be very much aware, I have been pressing the Economy Minister for nearly an, a year now to deal with many of the issues in, in this debate today. It is very clear that our, our world economy has been severely battered by COVID-19. Uh, lives have changed measurably. Uh, and businesses have been severely restricted and indeed closed as we try to tackle infections and to save lives. It is very clear that the impact of this pandemic has and will be with us for many years to come. Um, I know that for the past few months they have been amongst the toughest of the pandemic, but with the mass rollout of vaccines, <clears throat> which others have referred to, um, there is more reason for optimism, optimism and hopefully a glimmer of light on the horizon. As we move hopefully out of the pandemic, we clearly will need an executive-wide recovery strategy. Some would say build back better. I say we need to build forward better. Going back to the old ways is not the solution. We need to tackle structural weaknesses. We need to build on our strengths. Well, unfortunately, this does not always seem to be recognised by the departments which are supposed to take a lead on economic development. Indeed, one of the weaknesses of our government here is the stubborn silo mentality of departments and indeed ministers a reluctance to work together and a lack of communication. If we cannot have cross-departmental plans to navigate our recovery, truthfully, Deputy Speaker, we are wasting valuable time, money and squandering opportunities and indeed future people's opportunities by simply drifting and reacting to events in real time. No, I want to get through. Thank you. For example, the Minister of Economy has ruled out, rolled out numerous and indeed very welcome programmes for skills, apprenticeship recovery and made additional funding available for higher and further education. We have had our differences, but I have to place on record that the Minister has done a job of work to tackle these issues. However, it does not relate strategically to the work being carried out by the Department of Communities in supporting people in employment. In reality, the two are not on the same page. Indeed, one wonders sometimes, are they even reading the same book? 
The Department for Communities also demonstrates a lack of urgency to the Department of Economy, particularly with regards to the launch of and references be made to the Job Start scheme. Its equivalent in GB launched on the 2nd of September. Where is it? We have to have an answer to that. I understand that, the, that, that this is an emergency, the like of which we have never seen before. But if we continue to simply react without a plan or planning, we miss the opportunity to maximise the impact of spending and cross-departmental working. Deputy Speaker, the drift needs to stop. As noted in the motion text, the job retention scheme will eventually end. We know it will end, in theory, in April, but many of us will hope that it will continue on as the vaccine programme starts to build back resilience in the community. Thousands of people may not return to roles that they had in March 2020. So we need to have a comprehensive plan in place for job creation, upskilling and attracting the jobs of the future. We need to adjust to the new pand economic realities of the pandemic and facing the situation post-Brexit. This means that selling Northern Ireland's strong and unique advantages. The motion text notes that one of these coming out, out of the results of the protocol. The protocol is not the outcome that I or the Alliance Party wanted. We wanted a minimum friction in all directions. And indeed, the backstop would have delivered that in a much better way forward. However, our national government has sought the hardest Brexit, leaving us uh, by necessity with the protocol. And unless the UK government signs agreements that make it unnecessary, we must make the most of what we've got, streamlining operations and pressing our government to reach lasting solutions with the EU as they promised to do. Nonetheless, this should be a game changer for our economy within the UK market, but also within the EU single market for goods. Instead of being a peripheral region of the Europe, Northern Ireland should be the pivot point and a centre for trade, east-west, north-south, Europe and UK. In recent days, we have heard that Invest Northern Ireland has increased uh, its uh, interest from foreign investors and a result Northern Ireland, with Northern Ireland's new trading the arrangements. The remarks to close. I will. We are in an uncharted territory, Deputy Speaker, so we need a plan for the future, a plan that delivers. Unfortunately, up to now, we have been drifting. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And again, I rise to speak against the motion and to support the amendment. There is no doubt that COVID-19 has had a terrible impact on every element of our society, whether that be business, leisure, faith, community, sport or family life. There has not been a person that has not been impacted by restrictions and indeed uh, by COVID's effect on their, power or on their businesses or indeed on their livelihoods. So we take this very seriously. And, and while I support 100% what has been said in relation to a recovery plan, we must also uh, look towards how that is a collective effort because it is not the fault of a, an individual minister or an individual department what department they got before COVID came along. COVID has impacted upon them all, and it's a collective effort and a collective strategy, as outlined in the amendment, which I will support. But COVID has had an impact. My colleague, Mr Stelford, alluded to £100 million a week in costs and thousands of jobs. I think we're only on the tip of the iceberg as to the long-lasting impact some of these restrictions will have. But I have to say, the motion from the SDLP is full of double-speak. Double speak in relation to COVID, in one hand saying about. Uh, well. I'm grateful to my friend for giving way, not least because it gives him an extra minute. But um, the member would agree with me, I'm, I'm sure, that a recalibration of the economy is underway. Would he agree with me that perhaps as we roll out the vaccine and more and more people uh, get the protection they need, a recalibration of the way the government has functioned over the last 12 months, with one department dominating all others, is also needed. Members, an extra minute. Absolutely, and that certainly will come. And while we talk about the double spike that has happened here, COVID, in the one hand, saying about the damaging impact that restrictions have had, and on the other hand, saying in the public commentary, being so lustful to desire the certain restrictions that are in place. You can't have it both ways. In relation to the protocol, talking about the benefits of a protocol, the rigorous implementation of a protocol, which is inevitably damaging to businesses right across this country. This motion is filled with double speak. And the, the, it's, it's quite notable, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this, this uh, motion 
is a deliberate styled attack on both the Minister of Economy and the Minister of Finance. And if the SDLP want to talk about records throughout COVID-19 and the schemes, I'm happy to do that because while the SDLP was dragged to the table to put support in place for our lorry drivers and our taxi drivers, we've watched as our... Uh, Yes, absolutely. And we've watched as these lists of those that are willing and wanting to get their driving test are lingering, uh, can't engage in the workplace because they have no transportation. Let's compare that to the record of the economy minister. Nearly half a billion pounds of schemes to support businesses and individuals throughout what's been a difficult time. Could she do more? Absolutely. She would want to do more. But let's not forget those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones because I can see how this may come from an opposition uh, party, but a member of the executive knows full well the financial responsibilities placed in every department. Nearly half a billion, 30 schemes, Department for, for Economy, 10K, Small Business Grant Scheme, 25 Grant for Retail, Hospitality, Tourism and Leisure Sectors, Micro Business Hardship Support, new, Newly Self-Employed Support Scheme, Limited Company Director Support Scheme, COVID Restrictions Support Business Scheme, Part A, Part B. Do I have to go on? I think I will. Wet Pubs Business Support Scheme, Large Tourism and Hospitality Support Scheme. The list goes on. It's incredible. I have a document here of over 30 schemes. What have the SDLP brought forward? What have they done in support of those that are struggling throughout COVID-19? Only advocate for the very restrictions that have put those people in to isolation in their homes with no jobs, no ability to get back into the workplace. Let's dawn with reality. And the reality is there must be a collective response. And that's why I'm so sad as to the tone of this motion. I, I, just for a moment, I will before the end, because I want to get on on the second double speak contained within this motion. And that is indeed the support for the protocol. What a double speak if ever I've heard it. Again, we see the very useful pawns of the Europeans sitting on the benches opposite, advocating for a very protocol that places limits and restrictions and denies opportunity to Northern Ireland business, whether that be unionist or nationalist or other. You know something, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is a very much a case of chasing fool's gold at the end of a rainbow, riding the very unicorn that they talked about throughout the Brexit process. They have been useful pawns in this game. Rather than putting the needs of Northern Ireland first, they have put on record their rhetoric in relation to Brexit and hampered the opportunities contained with it for our business. You know something, in the short term, prosperity in homes across Northern Ireland during the recovery will only be protected by ensuring businesses already doing trade with by far Northern Ireland's largest market and most valuable market, Great Britain, are being able to continue to do so in a new and costly way provided by the very protocol which these members opposite called for its rigorous implementation. It is quite useful to note the drawback in language from the members opposite. Now, Would the member draw so much to close? That this protocol, this protocol damages Northern Ireland and damages Northern Ireland businesses and it's high time the members realise that. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Philip McGuigan. Mr Melgut, for your last can call you. Brexit uh, has been opposed upon us by the DUP and the Tories. Uh, so I just had to mention that before. The point of order, Mr. Story. Mr. Speaker, clarify the accuracy of the comments made. The leaving European Union was a result of a democratic vote held in the United Kingdom, of which the member opposite has a national insurance number four. The member has put his point on the record. I call Mr. I, I thank my constituency colleague for allowing me uh, the opportunity to, to clarify. A hard Brexit has been imposed upon us by the Tories uh, and the DUP. Uh, and nobody could have predicted the current uh, worldwide COVID pandemic we are currently in or its impact. Uh, Whilst the, our first priority of the executive and this assembly has to be protecting the public health and lives of our citizens, 
Uh, there is no doubt that COVID has brought harsh economic conditions, and this is a very worrying time for many uh, businesses and workers concerned about their current financial conditions and also worried about their future financial conditions on the other side of the pandemic. Add in uh, a disastrous uh, Tory DUP imposed hard Brexit into the mix uh, and the threat of climate change, it is clear that we need a comprehensive economic recovery strategy. And whilst the Economy Minister is clearly responsible for uh, economic policy, any recovery strategy must have buy-in, input and contributions from all executive ministers. And uh, as our amendment uh, states, any re recovery strategy must transform public services, create more jobs and build back better from the current crisis that we're in. Go ahead. I agree that any strategy must be um, aimed at providing new jobs and also retraining people. Would he agree with me that the cancellation of the job skirt scheme after it was actually evolved to try and be Northern Ireland specific is deeply lamentable given the impact this is going to have on people who are now wanting to get into paid apprenticeships and also sectors who want to actually encourage young people to join them? The members next minute. I think we, we, we need to encourage, uh, through as many possible avenues as possible, people into businesses, uh, people into employment. Uh, and I mean, I, I certainly uh, am optimistic that any uh, executive current uh, or recovery strategy will do precisely that. That's what's, that is what's needed. It must be based on supporting workers uh, and their families. It must also support businesses here, including uh, SMEs. Uh, and it also obviously has to, as other people have said, tackle regional um, imbalances. As Sinn Féin's environment and climate change spokesperson, it should go without saying that we uh, need to build back better and greener. Our recovery must be built on working towards a zero carbon future. If there can be any positive taken from COVID, it is clearly uh, that uh, shone a light on how uh, work practices transport infrastructure can be redesigned to deal as it has done with COVID. Uh, so when we're rebuilding and building uh, for the future, some of those lessons learned must be implemented uh, and used to tackle climate change and or an economic future that does create better cities uh, with less traffic and cleaner air and better air quality for all our citizens uh, who live within them. I mean, I, I look at other uh, European cities at the infrastructure developments and act active travel policies uh, brought in throughout uh, the last year. And I can't help but think that we need to be much more ambitious here in the North moving forward. An executive recovery strategy must not only deliver a Green New Deal, it must do so by delivering a just transition. Strategy, the strategy must allow businesses and workers to buy into that and participate in a better way of doing things. A green economy will create additional well-paid employment, harness our abundant renewable energy resources, lower costs for families and businesses, create warm homes for those in fuel poverty, and provide public transport for all, including those living in isolated areas. Uh, last can call you. I mean, five minutes is, is nowhere near enough uh, to outline all that, that would, is needed to outline in such an important debate. Uh, in terms of the economic uh, future for citizens. But I do want to point out, just in conclusion, that uh, Tory austerity over 10 years has had a very severe negative impact on public services here on the North and on our economic prospects. Uh, so moving forward, we do need to see further devolution of fiscal powers uh, to the executive, and then we need to see them used wisely and in the interest of those who live here. Gary Milgan. <coughs> Members, question time is due to begin at 2 o'clock. I suggest that the House takes the ease until then, and this debate will then continue after question time when the next speaker scheduled to speak to the House is Mervyn Story.
Okay, members, we'll now resume the sitting, and uh, it's, t- it's time for questions to the first and deputy first minister. I call Steve Egan to ask the first question. Steve uh, Egan. Question one, please. Gary Mogan, Ken Corley, and with your permission, I'll take questions one, two, and three together. Following the EU's triggering of Article 16 on the 29th of January, the First Minister and I requested a meeting with the European Commission Vice President Maros Sekovic. The meeting took place on the 3rd of February, and we appraised him of the current situation regarding the implementation of the protocol and its impact here. The meeting was constructive, and it led to an agreement to work together to address the remaining protocol issues. Following the meeting, the European Commission and the British Government released a joint statement confirming their commitment to the Good Friday Agreement and agreeing to use the joint committee structures to work intensively to find solutions to outstanding issues. This commitment to find solutions is very welcome, and I am pleased to see that it was reiterated again in the joint statement from the European Commission and the British Government following a further meeting on the 11th of February. The First Minister and I continue to attend meetings of the Joint Committee and will use its structures to ensure that our position is understood and to seek the best outcome for our citizens and for businesses. Concurrent with these ongoing discussions, we are continuing to work to identify, assess and seek to resolve immediate operational issues associated with the end of the transition period. The Department for the Economy, alongside InvestNI and Intertrade Ireland, are continuing to engage with many sectors to clarify the terms of access to the different markets and to encourage and enable export growth that can help drive our economic recovery. Supplementary, Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Deputy First Minister for her comments so far. Um, did Marius Sekovic give any indication that he was listening to the very legitimate concerns of the people of Northern Ireland, in particular those as of the unionist community, about the very invidious nature and divisive nature of the Irish Sea border itself and the fact that the protocol is part of the problem and not part of the solution? Well, I can confirm to the member that the Vice President of the Commission listened intently to what was said in the meeting, um, and further to that, actually, as you'll know, um, towards the end of last week, had a series of meetings with both business leaders, civic society leaders here, to listen to people's uh, concerns. And I welcome the fact that both the EU side and the British Government have recognised the need to implement the protocol, to iron out all the issues that have been, adre- that have been identified, and to find solutions. And that's where everybody's efforts should be right now, in trying to find solutions to give the businesses the clarity, the stability that, that they crave, and the certainty that they crave for the months ahead and, and what the, the future trading uh, patterns look like for them. What we're dealing with now is obviously the outworking of Brexit. Uh, there was always going to be major ramifications in terms of Brexit. Thankfully, we have a protocol that actually offers a solution to um, what is a huge problem. And they call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, First Ministers, um, uh, just a few days ago, Invest NI said Northern Ireland can quote, become a gateway for the sale of goods to two of the world's largest markets. Uh, because of our unique position, we are at the hinge point of the British market and the EU, mar- EU single market of half a billion. Uh, First Ministers, what are we doing to maximise access, to maximise the benefits from the dual market access, to create jobs and prosperity for people here? Because we are in a unique position, envied not just from other parts of the United Kingdom, but across this continent. Well, just to say, I agree with the member in terms of the opportunity that we have, and we do have access to both markets, which is a strength, um, which would be obviously the envy of many others in terms of their ability to trade. So I think that uh, the fact that we have that access to £450 million in the EU market is something that we need to work on. I, I, I've said in the original answer that work is underway with the Department of the Economy, Invest NI, and also Intertrade Ireland, because I think it's important that they, they all work together to work with the sectors, to identify the markets, to work on, up on the opportunities. So we need to see more of that, and we need to use our unique position to, to attract jobs, to attract um, investment here at large. Uh, there, there's huge um, opportunity, I think, for us. So what we need to see is the dedicated um, economic strategy coming forward from the Department of the Economy. And I know that over the course of today and tomorrow, this House is discussing um, economic strategy, and I look forward to, um, to all of that. But I think it's important that we do maximise uh, the benefits that we have and that we work with the business community, with traders, with retailers and everybody else. We try to get the certainty on the, on the issues that require certainty and then let's look for the opportunities. Call Archibald. 
Can I thank the Minister for her responses so far. Would the uh, First Minister uh, agree with me that the Executive should develop an overarching economic strategy to maximise the benefits from our continued access to the European single market and its 450 million consumers? Again, I thank the member for the question, and I do think that, again, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to work to develop an, an overarching economic strategy that will take all the executive working together across every department. Um, it's no, it will not come as any surprise to the member that the, the disruption that we're experiencing right now, the difficulties that are being experienced, um, are as a direct consequence of Brexit, um, a Brexit that was rejected by the majority of um, people across this uh, community, but also the majority of people in this House. That's my, my own um, view. But I think that uh, for us as an executive, and um, for us as a, across this assembly, our collective effort must now be to focus um, on the opportunity to protect jobs, to protect livelihoods, and that's why we need to have the, the issues of the Joint Committee uh, providing solutions, and let's all work together to actually provide those um, solutions, and I think these are the opportunities that, that we have in front of us. I call Jim Allister. Does the Deputy First Minister accept that commerce between Great Britain and Northern Ireland has been impeded by the protocol whose, imp whose rigorous implementation she demands. Why, therefore, does she want to punish the economy of Northern Ireland? Or is the simple truth that dislocation between Northern Ireland and GB is a political gain that she prioritises above the damage to our economy? Can I say that um, what we're experiencing right now is a direct consequence of Brexit, a Brexit which you, uh, the member, uh, championed and, and brought, helped to bring it about. So what we need to do now is actually find solutions to uh, the issues that are outstanding. I want to see freedom, uh, free trade right across north, south and east, west. I don't want to see any disruption to trade. Um, I think that's in our economic benefit that we have, uh, that that fr freely uh, flows. So what we need to all be focused on right now, instead of playing silly games, it needs to be about what provides certainty to businesses, to traders, to retailers, what provides the certainty, what, what gives stability, what, um, what can we simplify. So let's use the avenues that are open to us in the withdrawal agreement, and that is the Joint Committee. And I welcome the fact that it will meet um, before Wednesday, I believe, and I also hope that both myself and the Joint First Minister are in that meeting also, so we have an opportunity to put across uh, the, the need for, for the, the issues of stability, certainty and simplification. Call Jonathan Buckley. Speaker, these issues are not caused by Brexit, but rather a denial of Brexit via pro, uh, protocol parties opposite. Some nine weeks into the Northern Ireland Protocol, can the Deputy First Minister point to any evidence, both anecdotal or substantial, that this protocol has any advantages for Northern Ireland businesses? Or is it a case that they just simply do not exist? And if so, would she join with me and others in calling out the protocol for what it is and ensuring that it is destined for the dustbin where it belongs? Um, my own personal view is um, thank goodness for the protocol. What we're experiencing right now, what we're experiencing right now is the fact that the British government didn't prepare. They didn't work with businesses in, in terms of um, being ready for a post-Brexit world. They run the clock down to the 31st of December. There was no opportunity to transition into a new trading arrangement. What we're dealing with now is the new trading reality as a direct result of Brexit. So what this executive has to focus on, what this assembly needs to focus on, is actually ironing out the difficulties that have now arisen as a direct result of Brexit, is to work with the British government and the EU side to make sure we get solutions to those things, and then let's look towards the opportunities for the future, and let's ensure that we uh, grab all those opportunities, that we help to create jobs and employment here, that we help our local industry uh, because there are new realities of trading patterns. So there's opportunities now for smaller businesses here who traditionally couldn't supply into, for example, some of the big supermarkets. How can we support them to make sure that they can do that? So that's where um, our efforts need to be focused. It's around stability, it's around certainty, and it's not around playing games with the protocol that has been agreed over the course of four years. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much to the Joint First Minister. Um, First, Joint First Minister, can I ask you what confidence our business community can have in an executive that's failing to be able to work together? How will the negotiations go if that relationship does fall apart, um, given the fact that the self-harm that Brexit has created to this place? 
We are dealing with um, a post-Brexit world, and the executive has no um, other option other than to work together. Um, everybody needs to be focused in the same direction, and that needs to be to iron out the issues that, that need to be resolved. There are things that are a direct result of the new trade and reality. There are things that are um, a direct result of the fact that, as I said, the deal wasn't struck right down to the wire, so um, people haven't had time to adjust. So there are, of course there are going to be issues, um, and they're genuine issues, from, particularly from a, a business point of view. So let's get the resolution to those. I look forward to the Joint Committee on, um, on Wednesday, and that gives us an opportunity to actually try to hopefully have some outcomes. So there are a number of issues that have been resolved, um, the issue of steel, for example. There, are still, there was some um, clarity given there. There's a whole um, list of issues which we continually raise to try to get um, clar clarity on, and I welcome the fact that there has been progress, but there's surely there's definitely more to be done, and our job should be to just continue to find the solutions. I call Christopher Stafford. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the triggering of Article 16 by the European side was, I'm sure the Deputy First Minister would agree, a hateful, spiteful act by an incompetent, bungling European bureaucracy to disguise the fact that it had singularly failed to deliver a proper vaccine rollout for the people of continental Europe. But Article 16 has now been triggered. Would you agree with me that in future, UK governments should not be reticent about using it to defend our interests the way the European side did their own? Well, firstly, um, I would dissociate myself with your language completely. Um, secondly, I would say that um, what, what happened uh, on the EU side, whenever they said that they were going, indicated they were going to trigger Article 16, um, was wrong. I've said that publicly. It was wrong. Um, but you don't fight fire with fire. You don't fight back and say, well, you know, they threw their dummy out of the prams, so let's us do it too. Let's find solutions. Let's find solutions to the Brexit that's been foisted upon us by the Tories, which your party supported. And I call Nicola Brogan. Question number four, please. With your permission, can Corlea, Junior Minister Kearney, will respond to this question. We want this to be a truly shared, equal and safe society for all of our people, regardless of race or ethnicity. Unfortunately, Racism and hatred remains an unwelcome presence in our society. The First Minister and I attended a meeting with the Racial Equality subgroup earlier this month. This reinforced the huge impact racism has on people's lives and how important it is that we continue in our efforts to tackle hatred and prejudice. We are doing that through the implementation of our racial equality strategy, tackling racism and hate crime is the central aim of this strategy, and we remain fully committed to delivery of all the key actions within it. Progress has been made on a number of these. We have completed a review of the Minority Ethnic Diversity Fund to ensure that it best supports local groups to promote good relations between people of different ethnic backgrounds. We have reviewed the Race Relations Order and are now preparing options for enhancing the legislation. We will shortly be consulting on a draft refugee integration strategy. We are also currently considering the recommendations from Judge Maranand's report on hate crime legislation, and we very much look forward to seeing these implemented. Tackling hatred is the responsibility of us all in government and indeed wider society, and we will continue to drive forward this critically important work. Let me say once again. There is no place for hate, discrimination in our communities, and we will not tolerate racism in any form. We are committed to tackling these challenges, and it will take us all working together to deliver the positive change that is needed. Supplementary, Nicola Brogan. Thank you, um, We recently witnessed appalling racist remarks from a DUP MP who then refused to withdraw or apologise for such offensive comments. Would the Minister agree with me that um, comments like this not only run contrary to the objectives set out in the um, racial equality strategy, but also go against the Executive and this Assembly's opposition to any form of racism? Just last week, the, the First Minister Junior Minister Middleton and myself met with the Racial Equality subgroup. And that group 
as I indicated, has specific responsibility to advise on the implementation of the Racial Equality Strategy 2015 to 2025. And speakers at that meeting recall their experiences of everyday racism. They also reflected on their experiences of institutional racism, critically intergenerational poverty, as it interconnects with the reality of racism, and also the effects of precarious employment and zero hours contracts that have a disproportionate effect within our ethnic minority population. So it was a very sobering meeting at Kyungkorya. In some respects, we might want to describe it as something of a reset moment, uh, if you like. Because contributors set out the task ahead if we are to build a future that values racial equality and also racial justice. Now, as for the, the songs of praise remarks by a senior DUP politician that you reference, it is clear to me that when senior politicians feel that that type of public commentary is acceptable, then we still have a way to go, uh, Mr Speaker. The remarks were insulting and they were offensive, and, and I acknowledged that during our meeting with the racial equality subgroup. And those remarks contrast starkly with the future that we should all be seeking to build together. And just as they run contrary to the vision of the racial equality strategy owned by the executive, they also speak to the need for robust political leadership across this chamber to confront all forms of racism and to give leadership to build a community that is defined by inclusivity, which celebrates our diversity, is known crucially for its zero tolerance of racism and is renowned that this place becomes renowned as a welcoming place for everyone who has chosen to make this place their home. Marshan Achan Korya, ni mor da ahan kyanra san seal sahi agas palachiakta. And for the hyasu, in Aden and Kenya has, and shiakta has, agas gach sai sa der yalu. Tore maiga. Tore maiga, thank you. And Nicole Colin McGrath. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, a key component yet undelivered of the racial equality strategy is a refugee integration strategy. And given that today I was sent a social media ad for a vacant house in Northern Ireland that included the line, foreign nationals need not apply, where are we with this much needed integration strategy? Uh, and you, you raise a very important issue in relation to the, the progress of the, racial, uh, of the refugee integration strategy. So allow me to, uh, to set it into this particular context. Uh, work has progressed in this particular matter. And in order to get you the specifics, colleague, if you just bear with me. We, we have, in fact, advanced that. It's one of uh, our 11 particular themes within the racial equality strategy. It falls in the context of how we deal with uh, refugees and those who are asylum seekers in this place. Uh, we are engaged directly with the British Home Office in relation to the bringing forward of uh, their recommendations and views on this particular matter. But we have made it very clear that uh, we are acutely concerned with the potential implications that that would have for how we ensure that our uh, racial uh, minorities, our ethnic minorities, and those who have come to this place as both asylum seekers and as refugees are properly regarded, properly included, and are not in any way economically disadvantaged as a result of coming here to make this place their home. Well, Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, and I thank uh, the Minister for his answer so far, because I think it, it's, it's incumbent on us all for the racial equality strategy uh, to work to help with diversity within uh, this part of the, the United Kingdom. Uh, but can I ask the, the, the Minister, is that for many from the, the, the BME, and especially the newcomer uh, communities, um, they cannot avail of the rules around the common travel area. Um, could he explain what we're trying to do to, to rectify that particular issue? I thank the member for his question. 
Again, th this relates back to how we advance the work that we have taken forward in relation to our Minority Ethnic Development Fund. We have the racial equality uh, strategy overview, but we also need to be dealing specifically with those who are asylum seekers, who are refugees. And, and in that particular respect, um, our work is uh, engaged, as I mentioned in answer to the question posed by the previous colleague, with the British Home Office in relation to ensuring that uh, travel does not become an impediment to ensuring that people who need to come here to live in this place for fear of uh, famine, war and other forms of injustices are in fact brought here. They are included in this society. We have them fully integrated and that they enjoy the same benefits of living in this place as any other member of our society within the context of our racial equality strategy and all of the programmes and elements and priorities that that reflects. Call Mark Durgan. Uh, I can call you. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. There is a lasting concern that organisations run by people from our own traditional communities who work with BME people are favoured over organisations led by BME people whose groups are often told that they lack the capacity to administer government funding or to run programmes. However, it is one of the stated aims of the racial equality strategy is to build capacity for ethnic minority people. Can the Minister advise on how the distribution of resources between race, race relations and community relations is decided upon? Um, away has done called this up in case in occur. We have in place a racial equality subgroup. Uh, as I explained, myself and the First Minister uh, met with them just last week. It's a very representative group uh, of individuals. We think that uh, they are very representative of the constituencies and the communities which they, they represent. We can always do better. We had a very good engagement with them about the importance of the work that they are carrying forward. We need to be listening to what it is they are saying. It would be a huge anomaly uh, and completely counterintuitive if we had a situation where uh, those of us who are from here would purport to know best the needs of those who are members of our racial and ethnic minority population. I think that the fix for that is by staying very closely engaged with our racial equality subgroup, which is an integral part of our racial equality strategy, listening to what they have to say, and then ensuring that when we have access to resources uh, to build capacity, to build inclusion, to ensure that the rights of those minorities are protected, that, that is done in a way which is absolutely in consultation with the needs of those citizens on the ground, articulating their needs and ensuring they are properly represented and reflected through the racial equality subgroup. I call Dolores Kelly. Question five, Minister. <coughs> and, uh, can I, with your permission again, I will answer questions five, six and ten together. On the 9th of February 2021, the Court of Appeal ruled that the Executive Office is under a legal duty to fund victims' payments and lump sums under the Victims' Payment Regulations 2020. The ruling gave the Executive and the NIO four weeks to find an agreed solution. The First Minister and I remain entirely committed to delivering the scheme, and the Executive Office acknowledges that it needs to be funded to operate properly. Along with the Justice and Finance Ministers, the First Minister and I are engaged in correspondence with the Secretary of State in relation to funding and, follow our, and following our request for an urgent meeting with him to address this matter, the Secretary of State has now agreed to meet uh, to this meeting and it is taking place tomorrow, the 23rd of February. It remains our firm view that the scheme should be funded by the Westminster Government as an addition to the block grant. Without additional funding for the scheme to the block grant, the Executive will be faced with very significant funding pressures. We will continue to make this case directly. Such discussions will not prevent TEO in the meantime from making the necessary requests for funding from the Department of Finance as it falls due. The £2.5 million advanced by the Executive has enabled a dedicated project team to be established in the Department of Justice to progress the, and the development of delivery structures for the scheme, and a substantial programme of work is underway. Progress to date includes ongoing development of an online system to receive applications, the appointment of an interim victims payment board, the appointment by the DOJ of an assessment service provider, and accommodation has been secured for staff who will be delivering the scheme. Mr Justice Michael Linton has been appointed as Interim President of the Victims Payment Board. 
The proposed allocation of funding in the draft budget would provide £6.7 million in 2021-22 for administrative costs of the scheme, which demonstrates the Executive's commitment to delivery. Part of this funding will enable the victims and survivors sector to recruit additional staff to support applicants. Dolores Kelly, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Deputy First Minister for her answer. Uh, um, the clock is very clearly running down in relation to this two weeks left. Are you telling me then you have a plan B, so to speak, in terms of getting everything in place, but will you have any money, will the executive have any money uh, to pay uh, victims at the, end of, uh, in, at the end of March or May? And had, have you given any consideration? I mean, obviously this campaign was led by those who were severely physically injured and subsequently those who suffered psychological damage uh, were then added on. I just wonder, would, would you be in a position, if funding was available, to get money out quickly to those who have suffered uh, some of the most hurt on a, from physically. I thank the member for her question and can I say that you know it's our intention to try and get the scheme up and running and the payments out the door as quickly as possible. These people have waited for far too long to get to this point. Um, the, as you know, the court ruling has uh, made it very clear that we have to fund the scheme, but we believe that given the fact that the scheme in itself is so far. Uh, it's different compared to where we were in terms of the Stormont House Agreement and what was agreed at that stage. So, um, in terms of the British government's own funding policy, it must fund, um, fund things that it legislated for. So, in this case, uh, we hope that we get some progress from the meeting tomorrow um, with the Secretary of State. We call Roy Beggs. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this year, the Finance Minister reported there were considerable underfunding. And, and money that may actually be returned to Treasury unspent because of money is returned to him. Has the Executive Office been in touch with the Treasury to ensure that victims uh, are not disappointed once again, to ask whether, at the very least, that funding could be used to pay the first year of the uh, Victims of the Troubles uh, Disability Scheme? Can I just assure the member that our focus and attention is on to get the scheme up and running, to get applications in and to, get them, to have the, the payments made. Um, that is why we need to have this engagement with the um, Secretary of State tomorrow. And that includes a cross uh, group of ministers or, or sales from executive office. It is also finance and justice involved. And it is really, really important that uh, we have that meeting because we have been waiting for it for five months. Um, but it is really, really important that we have that discussion. Also, then, alongside that, the Finance Minister will, of course, on behalf of the Executive, continue to engage with the Treasury, also in terms of the funding of the scheme. I call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, Minister, can you clarify, is it not the case that the British Government developed the scheme and therefore by their own Treasury rules that they must fund it? I'm always, I'm always very conscious, um, Can Corley, when I speak in this matter, that um, victims who are in need of the pension are listening to the debate. So let me speak um, directly to them. The executive is absolutely committed to paying uh, and delivering on the scheme. Um, how the scheme is resourced, however, is a political uh, question, and it's a question that needs that urgent focus from um, the British government and from Brandon Lewis in particular. It also requires an immediate um, political solution because, as I've said earlier, victims have had to wait for far too long. And I appreciate that the needs um, of, of victims who are waiting on this pension are immediate and they need to be addressed without any further delay. And I say that, as, as I said um, in a previous answer, that um, we have been asking for this meeting with Brandon Lewis since, uh, I think, last October. Um, and we now have that meeting tomorrow. But it's really important that there's an outcome to that meeting and that we have a chance to, uh, to actually have a, a real conversation around the funding of the scheme. Um, the Victims Payment Scheme was designed in Westminster. Policy decisions were taken in Westminster about the scheme. And they have significantly increased the costs. Um, so, consistent with their own um, statement of funding policy, they also uh, ought to have made provision for the finances that are also required. Um, so, in terms of the cost of the scheme, I mean, compared to where it was initially uh, pitched and where it is today, it's, it's vastly different. Um, we've now received a report from the government's actuary department, which has used assumptions about numbers pr and provided by TEO to prepare for a range of costs. Estimates which range from 600 million um, at one end of the spectrum and 1.2 million, um, with a central estimate of about 848 million. So that shows the the, um, the level of challenge which um, this executive will have to face in terms of trying to fund um, this scheme, which is why we need the British government to uh, fund something which they themselves brought forward um, policy for and took policy decisions on. 
That ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Minister will be aware that the upcoming census, which is due to be carried out in the coming months, to provide us with an up-to-date, accurate record of all who will be eligible to vote at the next elections, that um, she and her party put out uh, false information across the media that this was simply an exercise being carried out solely to purge eligible voters off the register in Northern Ireland, which is factually incorrect. Would you now take this opportunity to correct that matter uh, on the floor of the House this evening? Well, firstly, um, the member will know that I'm speaking here as Joint uh, Head of Government and as Joint First Minister, so uh, anything that the party does is an issue for, uh, if you want to address it politically with the party, that's fair enough. But let me say that the electoral office's role it should be to facilitate people to get registered to vote, to make it easy for people to exercise their franchise, um, and it should take part in the democratic process. So I think that uh, any particularly given the period that we're in um, right now, the fact that uh, normal procedures can't, couldn't be followed. If you wipe a register now, um, how will they be able to go door to door, for example, given the pandemic? So I think that there are real pragmatic um, issues here that need to be addressed, and I hope that the electoral office uh, take that on board. You can on supplementary. Well, we thank the minister for her response, but she didn't take the opportunity, obviously, to withdraw the remarks that the party made and to apologise to the people for the misinformation that the party put out, which seems to be a constant uh, drip of, uh, the, of that particular party? It's not a question, uh, Can Corlia, but just let me say that um, we here in the North know how important our vote is, given uh, the history of, of this place and the fact that so many people were denied their access to vote. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us in political office to ensure that um, you make it as easy as possible for people to participate in the democratic process. Nicole Emma Sheeran. Gormagat Ken I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Given the legal and human rights imperative to provide modern, accessible and compassionate abortion services here, do you agree that it is the sole responsibility of the Health Minister to implement these services? Well, in simple terms, the answer would be yes. Um, certainly that's my view. Um, since the framework came into effect, there has been a legal responsibility on the Health Minister to ensure that he provides modern, compassionate health care. Uh, and abortion services and that they are provided via the health trust here. And I believe that his failure to do so is not only failing women who have a legal and a human right to compassionate health care services, but he's also failing his own health trusts who have a right to expect leadership from, uh, from their minister. So women in, any, in, in no circumstance should not be compelled to travel to access vital health care services at any time, let alone um, during a global pandemic. So the minister should end the delays and fulfil his legal responsibilities to make these services available to women. Um, his failure to do so to date is totally unacceptable. Minister. The new legal framework, as you have outlined, for abortion services came into effect in March of last year. Would you agree that it is now long overdue that the Health Minister acted on this legal imperative, that he should stop delaying and now provide these services to which women are entitled immediately and without further delay? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think that the, the framework and the legislation are, are crystal clear. It is the legal responsibility of the Minister for Health to ensure these services are provided. And the, the longer the delay is, the longer he's denying women their access to compassionate, modern and vital health care services. So this needs to end and the Minister must act. I call Michelle McElveen. Speaker, um, given the positive news today from Scotland in relation to data, which demonstrates that the rollout of the vaccination programme has led to a significant reduction in the number of people being hospitalised, is the Deputy First Minister in a position to confirm this type of data will be included in future modelling to inform decisions to move Northern Ireland out of the current restrictions more quickly? Thanks to the member. I, I haven't seen the data, so I can't comment on that per se, but I can say that and we've always had the view that the health uh, department should put all this information out into the public domain. There's a fair degree of information shared um, on the Department of Health's website, but I think that when it comes to us making these decisions um, and, and bringing the public with us, the more information we can put into the public domain, the better to help people understand uh, the pathway of the, of the, of the virus and trends and patterns and then actually how that informs our decision making. So my general answer would be just that we should put everything into the public domain that we can. 
Supplementary, Michelle McElveen. Okay, thank you. And I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer. We are all aware that work is ongoing to produce a pathway out of lockdown, and the Deputy First Minister should know that people are mindful of the need to protect lives and, and, and the health service, but they are also weary. Will she give a commitment that this will be meaningful, detailed, unambiguous, and with clear targets? Yes, I think it is really, really important that uh, we do. Uh, set out the pathway and as the member um, hopefully is aware that both myself and the First Minister intend to present that to this chamber um, next week, hopefully on Monday. And we very much want to give the public the, the, the route map um, how we're going to reverse out of the current restrictive uh, measures which we have in place. So I think that everybody's looking for some hope and they want they're looking towards the future. We want to spell that out for people and it needs to be a step by step process. But there's no uh, doubt in my mind that it needs to be a, a gradual. Uh, it's, it's going to be slow and steady um, in terms of lifting of restrictions. But with the rollout of the vaccine um, in, in place now and the fact that it's working so well, uh, and we commend all those that are involved in delivering the vaccine, that combined with um, keeping the, the virus suppressed for as long as possible, then we need to uh, chart out for people what the future looks like, and we hope to do that next week. I call Tim Allister. Given that not once but twice the High Court has had to call out the Executive Office on the failures in respect of the um, victim's pension, and very pointedly in the first uh, case made criticisms, criticisms personal to the Deputy First Minister. Would you like to take this opportunity to apologise to innocent victims for the added hurt and trauma that all of this delay at her insistence has caused them. Can I say that, again, this is a very sensitive issue and we should be very mindful uh, in the normal political discourse and we can you know, uh, go at each other politically. We can, you know, we, we look, obviously, yourself and myself will never see eye to eye on, on many given issues, if not all. But I think that when it comes to the issue of victims' um, pension, people need to be very sensitive to the issue. These people have waited for far too long to get their pension. Um, I'm committed to doing everything I can to make sure they get that, that uh, payment as quickly as possible. But the political reality is that uh, it was Westminster that took policy decisions um, that are far advanced from what, where we politically had agreed um, previously. Uh, therefore, it's incumbent upon them to also resource that because the challenge, like I talked about the, the costs and the fact that um, we could be looking at a, a central estimate of um, 848 million pounds. That's a lot of, of uh, financial resource that this executive would have to bear the brunt of if, if, um, if the British government aren't forthcoming with finances. That would put this whole executive and assembly in a very, very difficult position because uh, we'd have to take the money from health, we'd have to take it from education, we'd have to take it from all the other um, public services. So I'm, I'm very focused on getting a solution. I'm very focused on um, trying to uh, find the, the money, and I'm very, very focused on making sure that these people do not have to wait for a moment longer. Supplementary, Jim Allister. For all those words, the minister is unable to say sorry to them, not for the first time. Could I ask her, are we now in a position where who gets the pension is being abandoned as a stalling tactic? Has the Deputy First Minister come to the realisation that that issue is settled and will not be used any further as a stalling tactic? The victim's pension should be paid to all those people, every single last person who has been um, directly impacted in the conflict. So anybody who has received um, injury should be, should be um, able to and be eligible for the scheme. So I, I do believe that there's a whole cohort of people that have been actually left out of this scheme, and I know that they will um, fight this case in, in the courts, and I support them in doing so, because they are equally entitled um, to get a pension. So, as I said previously, my focus, my priority, is making sure that we get the pension paid. My focus and priority is making sure that the victims are no longer, um, that the, the payment is no longer delayed, and the British government must uh, step up and actually resource something which they themselves took policy decisions in regards to. I call Paul Given. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will join with me in commending uh, the rollout of the vaccination programme here in Northern Ireland and the numbers in which people have now received the vaccine, heading towards a third of our population, and that is replicated right across the United Kingdom. 
How concerned is the Deputy First Minister, however, though, that in the Republic of Ireland we are looking at still only around 5 to 6 per cent of the population haven't been vaccinated? And how much of a threat is that to the people of Northern Ireland? Well, I certainly look forward to the day when all of the people who live on this island and across these islands and globally receive the vaccine. There's no room for any sort of nonsense or global nationalism or, or sorry, vaccine nationalism, which I've heard described. I mean, this, we're in a global pandemic. If there's ever a time for us to work in a global effort, then this is it. So I, I look forward to the day whenever we are all um, vaccinated and we actually get back to some sense of normality and people um, are, are um, allowed again the opportunity to be with their family, to be with their friends, to, to go about their daily business without the fear that comes with living in a pandemic. Supplementary, Paul Gibbon. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in terms of reopening our economy, and as you said uh, this morning, you're wanting to have a pathway to recovery to protect families, workers, and businesses, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, and let us have these restrictions removed from us as soon as possible and practically to do so in line with the health guidance. However, the Republic of Ireland has put in place enforcement against the people of Northern Ireland travelling in the Republic of Ireland, and yet we are a much safer country now in terms of our population. Is there any reciprocal enforcement being planned by this executive to protect our return to normality because of the Republic of Ireland's failure in vaccinating its people? The message across the board, actually, across both these islands, is to stay at home. That remains the case, even um, as you know, measures are announced around uh, what a path better recovery could look like, um, what opening up things again might look like. The message for now, and we're still in the middle of dealing with this pandemic, is to, to stay at home. So people shouldn't be travelling anywhere, whether that is from Clonoe, where I live, in, in, to Belfast, to, to um, Dublin, to Cork. People should stay at home. That is the message. That remains the message. We're still in the middle of this pandemic. We're still dealing with a very uh, challenging situation. Uh, we need to, whilst things are going in the right direction, and, it, and it, that looks good, but if we don't keep this virus suppressed for a period of time, then we're going to keep coming back to this yo-yo scenario of in and out of lockdowns, and that's not where we want to be. So what we need to see is a steady, uh, steady progress. Um, we want to publish the pathway next, next week, and I think that's really, really important to give the public an understanding of what the future looks like. I call Melissa McHugh and just to advise the member that you will only have time for your question. Thank you. Uh, can Carla, uh, 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 as an executive flagship project, can you provide an update on the importance of uh, resolving the delay to the Casement Park development? Thanks uh, to the member for his question. And obviously, um, you're, you're absolutely right. Casement is a crucial project, um, not just for, for Gales, but for this executive, because it is a, a flagship project. Um, for some time, so therefore the delay needs to be ended as soon as possible. And the finance minister, I'm glad to say, has included uh, 20 million pounds in the budget for the development. So, um, what we need to now see, because it's disappointing that we still haven't uh, had the plan application completed, but I would expect the infrastructure minister will now work to ensure that there is no more delays. Um, it's more than 10 years since the uh, casement project was announced, so it's time to return at casement to the. The, the shining beacon for Gales and Antrim, but for wider uh, the economic benefits it will bring to, to Belfast and, and actually, I suppose, to Ulster as well. Time is up. Could I ask members to take a raise, please, for a moment or two?
and each Bogimish could you cash to me done Ira Aragadish. I now call Robbie Butler to ask the first question of the Finance Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. I can see you, Mr. and Ira Aragadish. I call the Finance Minister. With your permission, I wish to group questions 1, 9, and 14. Mm -hmm. I, along with my executive colleagues, are committed to the ensuring mm -hmm. the delivery of the Victims Payment Scheme. With that in mind, as part of the draft budget, the executives allocated some £6.7 million towards the preparation costs for the introduction of the scheme. The wider payments issue requires urgent attention. While TEO did identify estimated costs in respect of scheme payments, the executive was agreed on the need to further the matter of funding with the Secretary of State whose predecessor's actions led to a significant increase in the potential cost of the scheme. The first, Deputy First Minister, the Minister for Justice and myself have been trying to meet with the Secretary of State for some time. He has now agreed to a meeting which is due to take place tomorrow. Robbie Butler for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister outline what those uh, likely funding levels might be, uh, any estimates that he has made for the Troubles Permanent Disabled Payment Scheme? and what bids, if any, the TU or the Justice Ministry have given to his office? Well, the uh, most recent report we got from the Government Actuary Department uh, estimated the cost of anything between £600 million and £1.2 billion, which is an increase on the previous estimate, high-level estimate that the Department for Justice had, had placed on this. Uh, and, of course, as he will know, the additional bits of that scheme, which were added in by the previous Secretary of State, including uh, psychological in injury, including injury to people based outside the jurisdiction, including uh, injuries and psychological injuries for uh, armed forces personnel, uh, all have sub very substantially increased the potential cost of the scheme. And while it's a demand-led scheme, it's very hard to give an accurate uh, uh, estimation, but clearly those costs, uh, I, I think, make it hugely challenging, uh, if not an unaffordable, for an executive to, uh, to, to carry this burden alone. Uh, not to mention the fact that it's, it's contrary to the British government's own policy, having set the policy and legislated for it. The, of course, the Department of Justice received money to, for the administration of the scheme, and the executive are very clear that in terms of the payments for the victims, which we wish to see happen and we're very committed to see happening, we need that discussion urgently, and that's why we've been pressing since last year for a discussion with the Secretary of State to try and apportion the costs of the, the actual scheme itself. Mr Thomas Buchanan for supplement. Thank you. Um, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I know the Minister has, has touched on this, but um, uh, given that the, uh, on the wider cost of the scheme, which the Minister has talked about running from £600 million onward, can the Minister um, advise the House as to what action he has taken to ensure that whenever the application process is made by the innocent victims, that the money will be there to, uh, to make the payment to them and there will be no further delays in this particular scheme? Well, of course, it's a matter for the executive to decide. Uh, and if the executive decides it's going to carry the burden of the entirety of the cost, then the upward figure, as I say, is estimated by the Government Actuary Department at £1.2 billion. And that will have a, a serious knock-on implication for other public services that we provide uh, over uh, the course of the lifetime of the scheme. And there may well be uh, much more upfront costs attached to that than were previously estimated, uh, given that people may opt uh, for a lump sum pension rather than uh, a, or a lump sum rather than a pension over many years. So all of these issues uh, create huge levels of uncertainty, and that's why we need that discussion with the British Government. Uh, the Secretary of State has decided to take the lead in relation to this, and we have been pressing for discussion with them because we want and we wanted to include uh, the, the payment levels in, this, in the draft budget paper that we have produced, and we certainly want to produce uh, the levels for payment in the final budget paper that we will come into in the next couple of weeks. Just to outline at the beginning, I think that it's disgraceful that the British Secretary of State has taken five months to respond to a request for a meeting on this issue, something, a policy and legislation that he brought forward himself and took five months to meet with ministers from this executive. Having said that, I am glad that he is now prepared to meet with you. Minister, can you outline what the potential impact will be for other departments? And I would like to outline that I absolutely support these payments being paid to victims. Victims should not have to wait any longer. But what is the likely impact if the British government do not step up to the plate in relation to funding this? Well, as I say, depending uh, on the level of cost, we're earning between £600 million and £1.2 billion, depending on uh, how upfront people seek payments. So that, 
could change the profile in terms of year on year. But if you took it at the upper level and, and, and did a rough allocation across departments, you were talking about Department of Health, uh, about £615 million, Department of Education, of £227 million, uh, and, and so on, right down the level of spending for all departments. So you can see it would be a very significant impact on our public services. That is not to play off victims and what they deserve and need against uh, public services, because that would be a very cruel thing of the government to try and do on us. Uh, who want to provide the best possible public services, but also meet the, the very real requirements uh, of victims. Uh, and that is why we need that urgent discussion with the Secretary of We need this issue resolved. Mr Jim Allister, for question. Is it not exactly what the Minister is doing, trying to play off victims against the public service in order to up the ante with the Secretary of State? Uh, and is there an acceptance that at the end of the day, there is no choice when one listens to the Court of Appeal other than this money to be found wherever it is found. And does it help by exaggerating the demands by saying, for example, 600 million of the Department of Health as if that was in one year, when that is over the entire lifetime of the scheme, which might be 30 years? Well, the, uh, Mr. Las Concorda, the, the member says the money should be found wherever it's found. It, it clearly doesn't indicate where it should be found, so he has not come off the fence. Perhaps he could say if he thinks the executive should pay for this in its entirety, that the British government shouldn't make any contribution. And if he feels the British government should make a contribution, then we are right in the executive to try and pursue them over that contribution to it. So he's sitting on the fence because he has not declared his hand. He's just saying somebody should sort this. It shouldn't go on much longer. Somebody should sort it. But of course, from his position in opposition, he doesn't have to come up with the answers for any of that. We are trying to sort it. We recognise that the costs over the 30 years, and that's the, the, the costs that I've attributed, uh, that the government actually department have come up with, not us, but the government actually department. And if we have to pay those, that will have a huge impact. And I have no desire to play off public services against the needs of victims. What we want to see is this issue resolved. But the British government added the substantial costs to this policy. Therefore, they have a duty to meet those costs. With your permission, uh, last concord, I wish to group question two and question twelve together. I have put forward a proposal to the Executive for establishing both the Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Commission. These include terms of reference and membership of both bodies. Once the Executive has considered these proposals, I hope we will be able to put both Council and Commission in place very quickly so that they can begin their important work. I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, Minister, as I understand it, the Fiscal Council will focus on the Executive's spending uh, plans but not its uh, revenue plans. Do you agree that the work of the Fiscal Council will be more meaningful if the Executive uh, assumes greater control over local taxation and revenue raising opportunities as a result of the important uh, work the Fiscal Commission will take forward? Well, I thank the member for the question. Yes, it's, it's, the intention is that the Fiscal Commission will look at uh, uh, that broad range, as it has been done in both Scotland and Wales on a number of occasions. Uh, the range of uh, economic uh, policy and revenue raising uh, levers available to the executive and make some recommendations. It is envisaged that the, the Commission would uh, engage over the, the rest of this calendar year and produce a report for the executive, which would more than likely, given the time frame we are in and the mandate, become the property uh, or uh, a point of action, if you like, for an incoming executive. Uh, and so clearly, when it has its work done and any decisions taken by the executive will then be become a matter of, of immediate interest to a fiscal council. Uh, so I see very much the work of both bodies being interlinked in that regard. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I welcome the fact these bodies are being instituted. I've been calling repeatedly for them, so I'm glad they are. But can I ask the Minister for some specific details? Will, for example, either the Fiscal Council or the Fiscal Commission be uh, set up in statute and legislation, giving it the grounding that, for example, the OBR has in London, indeed the Fiscal Advisory Council in the Republic? Will they also have independent economic forecasting powers, which will give real bite and insight into their recommendations uh, and, and really um, uh, underline their independence? Well, the propositions I have brought for the Fiscal Council are very much an initial 
a proposition to set the Council up. Uh, of course, the experience in other jurisdictions, he said, is that once it's been set up, they have moved on to a legislative footing, uh, and that indeed is something that I, I would imagine both ourselves and indeed the committee, which he sits on, would have an interest. Uh, and we would want and have asked uh, the, the personnel involved in both Fiscal Council and Commission to engage early uh, with stakeholders, including uh, the Finance Committee. Uh, and clearly, we would want to see that. We would want to see the uh, independence of it very firmly established, and whatever resource it believes as it begins its work is needed for it. There will be a resource provided from the Department uh, and support provided from there and, and uh, uh, senior officials in the Department to support both uh, Council and Commission plus the Secretariat uh, for both as well. Uh, but should they require any other resources or levels of support, we're very happy to look at that. But the, the initial proposition is to get these bodies up and established uh, and allow them to develop from there. My apologies, you should have called Chris Little first there, but Mr Little, you have the floor now. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Fiscal Council was a commitment um, set forward in the New Decade New Approach uh, Agreement in January 2020. So can I ask the Finance Minister when the Fiscal Council will be operational, how it will be funded and what its relationship with the Finance Department will be? Well, the, uh, the Council will be operational as soon as the Executive approves it, uh, which I would hope be in, within in a matter of days. Uh, its relationship with the Department is, is that we, the cost will be met by the Department of Finance, uh, and we have already budgeted for that. And we will provide a Secretariat and, and, and senior support in terms of a senior official of the Department. Uh, and then the, clearly the intent then is for the Commission, as other commissions, similar commissions did, uh, to move themselves onto a, a more solid footing in terms of legislative underpinning. Uh, and then uh, we will work with them if they have a specific other requirements that they feel are necessary, then we're very happy uh, to work with them. And of course, we have encouraged them to engage with all the stakeholders uh, as soon as they get up and running. Call Steve Aiken. Um, indeed, thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, Minister, for his remarks so far. Obviously, with the Fiscal Council, we would wish it to be put on a legislative and a framework and so that it's on statute to guarantee its independence as quickly as possible. But could the Minister outline what relationship he sees it developing, particularly with items such as the Procurement Board that he's now Chair of, and indeed the independent board that's being set up on infrastructure and other independent oversight boards that are being looked at? Well, I, uh, firstly, I agree with him in terms of moving quickly to that uh, position, and we have spoken together uh, around this uh, in recent days. Uh, and I, I see a role for the committee, of course, in relation to to that. Uh, the, the Fiscal Council, of course, will have a responsibility for looking over the executive's finances uh, for making sure we are on a sustainable footing. And therefore, things like the Procurement Board, which, which provide policy for a spending of £3 billion, will be an important function, which I am sure there will be an interaction with. And any of the other agencies, I think, which impact our bodies, uh, which impact in terms of our, our give advice in terms of spending, are something that I am sure its remit uh, would have an interest in. So we do fully expect the Council, when it is up and working, to have a wide engagement uh, both with outside of government bodies that have an interest but also inside this institution and the government departments and the various arms length bodies as well. Call Michelle McElveen for a question. Question three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the responsibility for airports rests with the infrastructure minister and while the responsibility for our connectivity and indeed wider economic support including the COVID business uh, COVID restrictions business support scheme to support businesses in the supply chains of effective businesses rests with the economy minister. My department is in the process of implementing a £10 million package of support for the Belfast airports under the emergency powers granted by the First and Deputy First Ministers. The infrastructure minister is providing £1.2 million of similar executive support to the city of Derry Airport. Keeping the airports open uh, is the first step to supporting the businesses that work with them. Uh, this support fo also follows on from a series of executive agreed announcements last year specifically to help sustain the aviation sector during the pandemic, including over £3.1 million in direct business rate support for airports and other businesses within the airport sites. My department is also holding £150 million aside for consideration of additional business rates relief in the next financial year. Regional airports will be considered as part of that. And this, in turn, is in addition to a broader range of schemes that have been put in place by the executive and Treasury to provide significant support to businesses more generally. If respective ministers believe there are gaps in provision of support for the industries they have responsibility for, then I will fully consider any proposals they develop. Michelle McAveen for supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his answer. Obviously, the huge drop in revenue as a result of fewer flights has caused devastating losses to other industries, such as um, 
engineers, travel agents, airport car parks and taxi operators. What is the Minister and his department um, doing to assist other ministers perhaps in preparing a package of measures to support those businesses specifically? Well, what we've been doing, uh, I suppose, almost like a crack record for the last number of weeks, is encouraging ministers to bring forward bids uh, for any area of responsibility or any sector that falls under their broad uh, ambit of their department uh, to try. And it's in recognition that some of the sectors that she mentions have thus far not received any support or some uh, very little. The support we provided to the airports did cover the businesses within the airport itself uh, and give rate relief there and, uh, and other support to them. And of course, as I said, the, in the first instance, keeping the airports open uh, and being able to pick up again whenever we emerge from this pandemic uh, is going to be crucial. Uh, but if there are other sectors, and I know in some cases some of them, there have been bids brought forward for the taxi industry. Uh, I am told that there may well be support uh, being sought in relation to travel agents, which I very much welcome. Uh, uh, but it really is for other departments who have responsibility for those sectors to bring bids forward. Uh, Jerry Carroll, for your cash. I call Jerry Carroll for question. Question four, please. Construction and procurement delivery (CPD) in conjunction with the civil service human rights or, uh, human resources sorry, uh, have completed a procurement to provide agency workers for a wide variety of posts within the civil services and agencies and non-departmental public bodies. Within that procurement, a total of eight contracts were awarded. The estimated total value of all contracts being £425 million. The use of, con of the contract is demand-driven, and therefore the figures provided are estimates rather than a guaranteed level of business. Like many organisations, the civil service uses agency workers to carry out work for a variety of reasons which cannot be completed by substantive civil service staff. This includes covering periods of staff absence or to support time-limited projects or contractual work or, where necessary, to cover permanent vacancies pending substantive appointments. Approximately 50 per cent of agency workers in the civil service are assigned to the Department for Communities to discharge benefit processing services on behalf of the Department for Work and Pensions under the terms of service level agreements. The salary costs of all those staff are funded by DWP via the Department of Communities. Of the eight contracts, six were awarded to Premier Employment Group Limited. The total estimated value of the Premier Employment Group Limited contracts is £394 million. Pounds. Jerry Carl, supplementary question for Jerry Carl. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. And you'll be aware, obviously, of previous uh, contracts with agency uh, firms. There have been a, a big overspend, and I appreciate he mentioned estimates, but I hope he can outline measures that are put in place to avoid overspends again. But given the fact that the controller and auditor general has expressed his concern that there is an over reliance on agency staff, and that I quote, strong evidence therefore exists that temporary solutions are being used to plug permanent gaps. It appears the Minister's decision is at odds with this uh, position. How can he commit to both addressing the reliance and over reliance on agency workers by announcing another lucrative contract for further use of agency workers? Thank you. Well, can I say there will be oversight and monitoring of the contracts to make sure that they are uh, properly uh, operated and, and, and the, the payments reflect the uh, service that has been provided. Uh, recruitment, which you know is, a, is not a, an overnight process, uh, is ongoing to fill permanent vacant posts. The majority of agency workers are administrative officer AO level. And as, the 15, as of the 15th of February, there were 1,749 agency workers at this grade in the civil service. A recent AO external competition that allowed current agency workers within the civil service to apply has resulted in over 560 letters of offer being issued to date. So there is an attempt to reduce reliance on that to, uh, to, to, increase, but, uh, to increase more permanent staff. But as I have said, 50% uh, of the, the agency workers that are used are directly through the DWP contract. Uh, which is a service level agreement they have with the Department for Communities. But uh, I agree with them, and we have enhanced the terms and conditions this year of agency workers. And uh, to, the, the best solution is uh, where it can be found permanent workers with proper terms and conditions and career prospects that it that allows. Question, Gemma Dolan. Well, good last, Karen Corley, and I thank the Minister for his answers. And Minister, I very much welcome the fact that you have required parity of treatment between agency and permanent workers in terms of pay, annual leave and paid time off for medical appointments. In addition to these improvements in, in conditions, has your department included any social clauses in the contract? Yes, well, as, as the member said, we have, we have changed uh, the, the terms and conditions to allow uh, similar uh, 
party with our party with the uh, issues that apply to civil service workers themselves. Uh, in, consult in consultation with the SIB, the Department has used the Buy Social initiative to include a number of social clauses in the new contracts. The contractor will deliver paid work placements for Buy Social agency workers and the business and education initiatives to uh, a school or an organisation within the voluntary community and social enterprise sector to support people's career development and employability. This support may include vocational talks, curriculum support, career guidance, workplace visits or mentoring. The contractor is also required to develop and maintain a human rights policy in relation to work carried out on this contract. Kerstig, Mark Durkin. Mark Durkin for Quinn. Jeremy, I'm going to ask John Corley of the Spray of Selection Ira for Honya at Fragri Gijisha. A few months ago, the Minister assured me here that the necessary resources were in place to support the recruitment, the recruitment of the announced 900 Northern Ireland civil service posts in universal credit over the next few years, given the 126 per cent increase in the number of claims, a number that is sadly, inevitably, going to increase even further. Now, it's my understanding 350 of these posts were advertised, yet, to date, not one of them have been filled. And the DFC draft budget indicates no additional money for recruitment next year. Does the Minister agree with me that this investment is vital to not only to minimise the hardship faced by claimants, but also to reduce the massive stress on current staff? Well, can I say I do agree with them in the latter points. Uh, where I disagree with them is the, the guarantee that I say to give many finance minister, which guarantees you what money is going to be in next year's budget, uh, is somebody that you should listen very carefully to. Uh, so I, I couldn't give any such guarantee last year because we didn't know what was going to be in next year's budget, and what we have been delivered at very late and short notice from the Treasury is uh, essentially a flat budget for next year, which for a department such as communities uh, to have the same cash available as they had last year. Uh, is effectively a, a cut. Uh, and I have had a number of meetings with the Minister for Communities. Uh, she's very correctly identified the pressures that he, he, he refers to, uh, and she very clearly is exercised to uh, ensure that she can employ the uh, requisite number of staff to deal with an uh, unfortunately very high level increase in the number of people presenting to claim universal uh, credit. So we will work very closely with her, and we hope to have an improved position by the time we get to the final budget stage. Andrew Muir for a question. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have all been greatly indebted for the work of our civil servants and officials uh, in very challenging circumstances, particularly from the Department of the Economy in terms of the assistance that they have given. We were recently reported there is a 25 per cent vacancy rate within the Department of the Economy. Is the minister, can the Minister give us assurance that everything is being done to fill those vacancies so that we can relieve the pressure upon the staff within that department? Well, of course, we will do all we can to support departments when they identify uh, the pressures. There are £1.7 billion worth of pressures identified just ahead of the budget. The budget did not deliver any additional cash, so that is a very significant uh, level of pressure to try and meet within existing resources. But, of course, we, we will uh, and we will continue to work uh, with all departments to try and assist them in managing the pressures that they face, including the pressures of recruitment. Call George Robinson for a question. Question five, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The member will know we are currently in the middle of a pandemic, and any future economic assessments will depend on the course and nature of the pandemic, the vaccination response, and the potential for virus uh, mutation. At this stage, it is not possible to accurately predict the medium to long term implications of the COVID 19 pandemic. How the pandemic impacts on the executive's budget will depend on a number of factors, the primary one being the approach that the British Government take to public spending in the medium to long term. We will know more once work commences on a further spending review, which will set out the medium, budget, uh, medium term budget envelope. Mr. Robinson, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And does the Minister foresee an impact on the capital spend from the executive due to the COVID 19 pandemic, which could have a detrimental impact on departments such as economy, health, etc.? Well, it, it very much depends. Uh, we have this year's budget, which is very disappointing, including the capital allocations and, and the resource allocations, because we, in effect, get the same amount as last year, given that costs rise, uh, salary costs rise, then you, uh, most of those larger departments, in effect, have a cut uh, to their budgets. So that is very disappointing. 
Uh, it will very much depend on what policy approach the British Government takes. If it reverts back to the approach it took to the 2008 crash, for instance, which it decided to cut public spending to introduce austerity policies, then we're into a real difficulty, because I don't think we've ever fully recovered from the austerity policies and the cuts that were imposed in budgets over a number of years. Last year's budget was the first one which gave all departments an uplift, and now this year's budget we're back to flat cash again. So it will very much depend on that going forward, but as he correctly identified, if there is a reduction in capital, then it will have an ongoing impact in terms of uh, how some of those bigger departments can spend out their money. Uh, Dig, Philip Wigan. Question for Philip. Gerard Melgard, uh, last can call you. Uh, this disappointing standstill budget provided to the executive for next year seems to indicate that the British government intends to use COVID uh, to justify a return to austerity, just as it did. Uh, in the financial crisis of 2008. Can I ask the Minister uh, if he agrees with me that austerity is a self-defeating right-wing ideology that will hamper economic recovery from the current health pandemic? Well, I think it's the wrong approach. Uh, I mean, if, if ever we saw a lesson for the short-sightedness, I think, of cutting public services, it was the advent of the pandemic itself, uh, when public services became hugely crucial. Uh, the health service in particular, but a whole range of public services that have been underfunded for many years. Uh, and, and the direct knock-on effect of that is that the restrictions that we find ourselves in place, which have an impact on the economic activity, are a consequence of trying to protect public services. Uh, to make sure the health service isn't overwhelmed. So there is a linkage between the two, uh, and it, it, it is a short-sighted policy, policy, short policy because it does impact uh, on longer-term economic planning and economic spend. So I would hope that it's not a direction the British government revert to. I hope they will have learned a lesson that the last uh, dalliance with uh, austerity policies did not serve uh, the public uh, generally well, and I, I hope that that's not a course they follow in the future. Alan Chambers for a question. And I thank the Minister for his answers uh, thus far. Uh, Minister, uh, can you make a commitment to ensure that the sacrifices of our health service are recognised and that health transformation will remain the priority in funding going forward? Thank you. Yes, well, I know that that is a key ask of the Health Department. Of course, uh, from my previous answers, uh, we have recognised that the health service was left under enormous pressure. But the executive when it returned last January, it set itself a priority of, of uh, collectively uh, trying to support the health service and that health transformation, uh, and that remains executive policy. So uh, even though we have limited resources, he will know that health does get the lion's share, then they tend to get the first call and any additional resources we get, and that's as needed, because we have seen, uh, if we needed that example over the course of this pandemic, how crucial and vital uh, the health service is to protect our population. So, of course, uh, I would wish that we had a much better budget to offer them next year, but we will certainly try and protect that transformation as best we can in the time ahead. I think we'll be able to get a quick question and answer on Aram Sir Cara Hunter, Lida Hull. I call Cara Hunter for Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Number six, please. Uh, I would like to group questions 6, 8 and 11, though I doubt we will get to 8 or 11 in terms of response. But during the January monitoring round, Minister Weir submitted a bid for £3 million for children's portable devices for the Education Authority. The bid was agreed by the Executive on 21 January 2021. The Department for Infrastructure did not submit any bid in the January monitoring round to maintain and improve rural roads. Uh, and for an answer to the member's question, having provided further additional resources on the 2nd of February and the 10th of February, subsequent to the January monitoring round, I have now asked the Executive Minister to provide final bids for funding in 2020-21. These are currently under consideration, and I will update the Assembly in due course. A brief supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, I'm mindful of the concerns uh, of those waiting in limbo for cancer surgeries across the north, and I'm sure you two share uh, my concern. Therefore, can I ask the Minister, has your department made any further funding available for private health care providers to enable more cancer surgeries to take place? Thank you. Uh, well, this was a conversation that was had uh, a number of weeks back at the Executive, and we were advised by the Health Department that they couldn't purchase uh, surgery in this year to be spent out in the next financial year. So uh, the allocation of, of some unspent uh, COVID money uh, wouldn't have worked in that regard. Uh, I, I understand and appreciate the points that she's making, although uh, purchasing surgery abroad might be uh, 
problematic anyway in this pandemic and the restrictions on travel. Uh, but we were advised that, uh, because it was discussed, uh, that uh, a surgery purchase now could not be spent out in the next financial year, so it wasn't possible to allocate money to that. There was no bid to come in for it in that regard either. Members, that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Speaker, grateful if the Minister could inform the House of um, the quantum of funds currently at risk of being unspent and therefore lost to the Treasury. Well, I, I, well we're still receiving uh, information from departments, uh, so we can't. Uh, suffice to say, uh, we do intend to bring an updated paper this Thursday to the Executive. Uh, which I hope will capture all that we have received to date. Plus, if we have left a little bit of leeway, if anybody has something in the pipeline that they want to bring to our attention, because my priority is to try and make sure that all of the sectors that have missed out uh, get an opportunity to have a case made for them. Uh, but we also put in place contingency plans, which we will then bring to the executive to spend out any remaining money to ensure uh, that the, the full value of that goes back into the local economy or local services. Mr Nesbitt, for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister. Has the Minister received a bid from the Minister uh, for Justice on behalf of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, bearing in mind the Chief Constable's warning uh, that he may have to lose uh, several hundred officers, which would amount to a net loss of 800 officers compared to the commitment of New Decade New Approach? Well, I think there is a difference in, in what he's talking about in terms of making a bid. The bids that I have been speaking about are bids for unspent COVID money, which was the, the, the parameters, or if you like, the, the framework of his original question. Uh, if, if, if he's then moving on to the budget next year, uh, because w the first question dealt with unspent money or underspent of money, Th that, of course, has to be spent in this financial year. If he's moving on to the budget next year, then, of course, as I had said in re response to previous questions, we didn't receive any increase for any department. Uh, so any uh, bids or pressures identified by the Department of Justice or indeed any other department uh, have to be set against that reality is that we have had no additional money for any department. We had no time to do a reprioritisation exercise, which may have taken money off one department and put it into another priority in another department. And so that left us with a very uh, difficult position to try and match for the year ahead. And of course, pressures in relation to policing uh, personnel come in under that as well. I call Mr. Robin Newton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, Finance Minister for his answers uh, so far. The Minister will be aware of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, and indeed their code of practice and their established rules. And that indeed is embedded within the Treasury's improving spending control guidance. Would the Minister agree with me that the devolved, wherein they were states within the Treasuries, devolved administrations and their arm's length bodies will be required to monitor and manage information about spending more efficiently and improve the skills needed to deliver their spending plans? Would the Minister agree with me that that is a good foundation for fiscal management? Yes, I think it is, and that's why we included uh, reference to the best practice in the OECD in the setting up in terms of reference uh, of the Fiscal Council, uh, whose uh, proposition around which I have put to the Executive. Supplementary for Mr Newton. I thank you, Mr Spe Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer, short though it is. Uh, Minister, would you agree then that the DECAL sub-regional stadia programme that was agreed by the Executive as a priority in which it was allocated £36 million back in 2011, on which a consultation started in November 2015, closed in February 2016, and then for some reason the Minister went out to a second consultation. We are now in February 21. No money has been allocated to the, the, the football clubs. Would the Minister agree with me that this does not meet the OECD established rules of good practice. Well, I think uh, what he also I mean, neglects to mention is that we had a three-year hiatus when the Assembly was down uh, in the middle of all of that, uh, and, so, and the Department uh, for Culture, Art and Leisure has now gone and been replaced by the Department of Communities, who have responsibility uh, for this programme. So uh, I, I think it's a matter, obviously, that the Communities Minister could answer to, perhaps not for her predecessors, as to what happened there, but certainly as to what is intended to happen uh, to that programme uh, into the near future. Uh, and and I, I agree with him that we, we want to see things work 
as efficiently as they can. And I also would share his, his view that investment in sports is a very good long-term investment for society as a whole. Um, sir, Cara Hunter for Newcastle. I call Cara Hunter for question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, my topical today refers to education. Can I ask the Minister, will he allocate extra resources for schools by extending the Engage programme uh, for another year and the provision of expanded IT support for schools and IT equipment for all children who do not have adequate IT at home for schooling? Thank you. Well, I, I, I I agree with her entirely that that's been a very, two very important uh, programmes that the Department for Education have run, and we have given money and, and recently in, uh, increased the money that we've given to uh, engage uh, programme, and also, uh, as I said in the previous answer, I think £3 million for additional uh, support for IT requirements for kids who are homeschooling. There will be COVID money available next year, not on the same level as we have had this year, where we're over 3.3 billion. I think we're, we're promised about half a billion next year. Some of that is earmarked for education, and I would imagine, because I know the Education Minister is uh, uh, very complimentary about the Engage scheme in particular and the value it has been, so I will imagine that he will be bidding for support on those grounds. I'd be very happy to support those bids. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. Um, given East Derry is such a rural constituency, I hear often about the difficulties with uh, broadband uh, and uh, digital poverty. So I'm just wondering what further steps are being taken by your department uh, to remedy this. Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, I, I recognise the problems. I represent South Armagh, which has very similar issues in terms of broadband con connectivity and rural uh, poverty and deprivation. Uh, and I know my own department have been uh, involved in a, if you like, a pilot scheme in terms of IT support for people, vulnerable people in, in areas who are struggling to get that connectivity, and it's been substantially oversubscribed. So we intend to look again at what resource uh, we can apply to that. Uh, and of course, I would encourage the education department as well to be looking at particular uh, in, in rural areas that do have difficulties because homeschooling is difficult enough uh, for parents who have full access to broadband, but where that is patchy or non-existent, then it's, ne it's virtually impossible for people. Rosemary Barton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker and Minister. Thank you for your answers so far. Minister, what should have been an automatic payment of winter fuel allowance this year, to take, which was to take place in November and December, appears to have been quite problematic in a number of areas. Can you explain the steps the Department are taking to resolve the issues so that there won't be a repeat of it next year? It, I seem to be answering questions on a lot of depart other departments' business uh, today as part of my topics, and that clearly is a Department for Communities issue. Uh, we, we, we provide the resources if we can, if the Executive approves that, uh, and then the Department has to carry that forward. So I'm not certain, uh, to be honest, what the hold-ups or difficulties have been there, and I think it would have to be the Minister for Communities who might uh, be able to provide you with an answer in relation to that. Supplementary question from Ms Barton. And Minister, what are, I was going to follow on and ask, uh, have, you, have you any idea how many people were affected and the finance involved in that effect? Uh, well, unfortunately not, uh, not with me at the moment, but I can undertake to ask the Communities Department and provide the member with a written answer. I guess now she hears Emma Sheeran for you, Kirst. I call Emma Sheeran for a question. Gormai, good last can call you. Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. The transgender community here are calling for a change in the law that allows people to declare their own gender identity rather than enduring a medical process requiring a medical declaration, as is the current process. Do you agree with such a change? Uh, yes, I, I do. Uh, and I met with Transgender NI last year to talk through this issue and how best to bring about change here. Uh, unfortunately, there is not sufficient time left in this mandate to bring through such legislation. However, I have commissioned research to inform legislation in the next mandate. The research went out to tender in November last year, and unfortunately, no proposals were submitted. Therefore, it has been re-tendered with a closing date uh, of the 26th of February uh, this year, and I very much encourage bids for this important work. Thanks, Minister, for that answer. Will the research that your department is conducting uh, refer to the 2015 bill in the 26 counties, currently the law? Uh, yes, I am conscious there is a shift internationally uh, uh, towards self declaration models of gender identity, so the research will examine the legislation south of the border as well. The fact that other jurisdictions have moved first means we can learn lessons from them. But it's also important that transgender people here are not left behind, so we do need to make progress on this in the next mandate. 
Here I'm Sir Mark Durkin for your case to call Mark Durkin for question. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Is the Minister aware of how much money came here by way of Barnet Consequential for the youth labour market intervention called Kickstart in Britain, proposed as Job Start here, but now known as False Start, as it too has been shelved by the Minister for Communities after months of preparation by businesses and promises to young people? Well, I firstly can say that any money, any money which comes as a bar and a consequence is up to the executive as a whole to decide what to do with it. Uh, so it's not for an individual department. It comes unhypothecated, as he will know from his time as a minister. He will also know as well that the programme hasn't been shelved, uh, but has run into the same difficulties as the ones he identified with employing people to deal with universal credit, uh, and that the department are very much concerned and desire to uh, press ahead with those employment support programmes. And again, it's a discussion we are having with the Minister for Communities, and again, it's an issue that we hope to address between now and the final budget paper. Mark Durkin, supplementary question for Mark. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I'm sure the Minister will agree with me, I think he already has, on the importance of upskilling our young people for employment and reskilling people of all ages, particularly given the employment abyss into which we are staring. Does he share my concerns that the impact that, that, that any failure to proceed with Job Start might have, combined with the impact on many employment and skills programmes uh, caused by the, the loss of European structural funds? Yes, I absolutely do agree with him, uh, particularly when, uh, as he mentioned in a previous question, the figures in terms of universal credit, the need to get people upskilled and reskilled and uh, to give some hope of employment to young people. Uh, so these, these programmes are hugely important, and that's why not only am I exercising trying to find support for the Minister for Communities, but we have pursued the issue of lost European funding. Uh, which the Department of Economy has a, it has a real impact there in terms of similar skills programmes. Uh, and so these are all going to be vitally important because we are going to face a significant economic downturn. We are going to, uh, already are facing uh, a significant increase in unemployment. Uh, and if we want to provide support for people to try and get them back into full employment, we need to assist them with skills uh, and, and re-education opportunities. Could we please bring uh, Colm Gildernew into the spotlight, please? And will to in Shin. And will Dunya be in Shin? Anybody there? Okay, here I'm Sir Colm Gildian for your question, sir. I ask Colm Gildian you to ask a question. Colm Agat, can last can call you August Colm Agat, good day, Naira. Minister, the pandemic has had a devastating impact on the fundraising activity of hospices. You have provided, I know, over 15 million of support to help hospices through this difficult period. Given the crucial role that these organisations play in caring for people with terminal illnesses, and given that there remains money to allocate this financial year, would you consider a further injection of financial support? Yes, I thank the member for his question. Uh, and I, can I say yes, as, as he has said, uh, we have provided uh, support for the hospices over the course of this year with the agreement from the Department of Health uh, and we are looking, currently looking at a further package uh, for the hospices uh, as part of some of the unspent COVID money we have to try and assist them and I, I very much as he does uh, and I'm sure all members in the House do value the services that the hospice provide and I was very glad that we were able to offer them some much needed support and we will uh, have been working with them to try and secure a further package for them. Supplementary question for Colm Gildenew. Minister, and I know you have touched on this in a previous answer uh, during the session, but can I just can I just ask for further uh, expansion? As a representative in a rural community, I'm aware that this is a time of year financially when spare cash is often directed to improve roads. And we all continue, I'm sure, as have I today, even around roads in, in very poor condition. Would you be open to a bid for, for a further bid for roads maintenance, Minister? Uh, well, can I say I would. Uh, I, I, I know from my own experience as having responsibility for roads, the time is moving on. 
because generally speaking, the road service as it was then would have been ready to go in January, February and March. We are now approaching the end of February, uh, but if should, such a bid uh, should arrive into the Department and, and it is felt, uh, because we had no bids in January monitoring for uh, roads maintenance or road improvements generally, but if such a bid should come in, I would be very happy to consider that. But uh, I suspect that uh, time is against that now, uh, but I am happy to consider one if, if such a bid would come in. Okay, members, that ends topical questions for today. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, we'll, if members just take their ease while we move back to the next item of business, which is a continuation of private members' business. Thank you. Okay, members, we will resume business, which is the motion on recovery and investment strategy. And the next person uh, to speak is Mervyn Storey. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am sure not all the nations just waiting with bated breath after question time to hear my contribution. More likely, they want to hear what the Prime Minister has to say uh, in relation to moving out of lockdown. However, <laughs> forgive me for being the cynic in this House. But when you read the motion, and when you listen to the proposer, and when you listen to some of the other contributions, you would nearly think that we are in the first shot of the 2022 Assembly elections. And the motion reads like and sounds like a party manifesto. Because maybe it is time, Mr Deputy Speaker, for the SDLP and others to seriously consider whether they are part of the forced mandatory coalition that we have in these arrangements. And maybe it is time for them, instead of trying to have the best of both worlds, that they actually come out and tell their electorate where it is they stand in relation to working together in an executive. Although I have to say the SDLP is not alone in acting in that particular manner or that particular fashion. We had, and I think he was right to raise it in this House uh, earlier, the issue by the member for East Antrim in regards to the job start scheme. And it seems as though the minister responsible for that particular issue hasn't really come out and told us the reasons why that scheme has been set aside. Did the minister want it rebranded? Did the, the minister want it redesigned? Was the minister nervous about being part of a UK-wide scheme? Those are all legitimate answers that need to be answered because they all have an impact on the economic recovery and well-being of Northern Ireland. And so I think 
Mr Deputy Speaker, we also need to ask a question of the Alliance Party, the party that would like to present themselves as the nine, either unionist or nationalist. We live in this world of we really don't know what we are, but we're up for whatever there is out there. And whatever is populist, be assured the Alliance Party will raise its hand to it. What did the representative say in regards to the executive? He said that when it comes to the ministers, they're still in their silos. Well, maybe the reason why they're in their silos is because the construct of this place has, re has resulted in us making silos. This is not a government, the same as any other part of these islands. This is a forced mandatory coalition, and therefore it's no wonder we have the outcomes that sometimes we have. And then, of course, Sinn Féin, who never ceased to amaze me at how they come up with uh, the, the schemes and plans that they get involved in. My colleague from North Antrim, Philip McGuigan, he wants us now to have more fiscal powers. So let's, take, let's ignore the 13 billion from the Treasury. Let's ignore the 4 billion that has come to Northern Ireland as a result of being part of the United Kingdom despite the protocol. And now we want to have more power, more fiscal responsibility. Well, will the members opposite tell us, is it water charges that they want to bring in? Is the parties going to come out clean and tell us what are the economic stimuli that they're going to introduce that's going to tax the people of Northern Ireland? Yes, I'll give way. Uh, he was first. No. <laughs> I thank the member for giving way, and I, I know that he speaks very passionately in this subject. But would he agree with me that to date, solutions have not been brought forward, or recommendations, or indeed even ideas from the parties opposite? Because in reality, what is provided just by means of the block grant and others is what keeps our place in the United Kingdom secure as it is today. Thank you, Member, for giving away, and obviously he makes a valid point in relation to that fiscal package, and that is vitally important. It's not the only reason why we want to remain part of the United Kingdom. But of course, let's, when we come to this motion, let's pull away all the rhetoric and let the party who proposed this motion be honest with its electorate that there have been huge problems created as a result of lockdown. But yet when the economy minister brings proposals to help local businesses click and collect as one example. What does other parties in the executive decide to do? Can't do that. Can't, can't have that. That's, that's our bridge too far. And then the press release is not dry until they're out saying, terrible, we need to support these local businesses. The traders are crying out for help. And they are. So therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think that we need to have a dose of reality in this House. Let's remember that, not that I would always take them to be the source, well, they're the source of most of all our information the today, to draw and that is in closely. relation to Google, where they said that 87 per cent of establishments in retail and recreation have had a footfall loss in the last five weeks prior to January. It's time for the party who proposed this resolution to come up with real ideas and not try to be part of an executive when in reality they would prefer to be outside the door. Um, I guess next, Iram Sir Gemma Dolan, and I just say to the member, she has four minutes, uh, and then we have to pass over to the minister, please. Thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic has given the world a different perspective on the way we live our lives. It has exposed flaws in traditional models and approaches to public services, but it has likewise progressed thinking and practice around new and different ways of working. An example of this being the regional hubs announced by Finance Minister last week. Probably not as a direct result of the pandemic, but possibly the pandemic was a catalyst, as we realise that remote working is feasible and productive. Enabling people to work closer to home promotes regional economic balance, reduces carbon emissions and perhaps most importantly promotes the work-life balance and health and well-being of employees. Investment in rural broadband through Project Stratum must mean that those in rural areas are not impeded from working remotely. A strong regionally balanced inclusive economy is essential if we are to tackle the social and economic challenges facing us. 
Any economic recovery cannot repeat the mistakes of the past, and it must provide decent and secure work. Sinn Féin is committed to strengthening collective bargaining rules to employ, empower workers, such as the need to remove the 20 employee threshold for strategy trade union recognition. There has been significant spin from the Executive in relation to business survival. However, trying to keep the pre-pandemic economy alive will not bring about econ economic recovery. We have already seen an adverse impact on our high street, with a number of retail outlets moving exclusively online. To achieve the kind of economy we want and need to see, key structural weaknesses in our economy need to be addressed, such as too few higher paying jobs, the skills gap and a regional imbalance. We know that higher pay, higher pay and greater stability brings benefits to people's wellbeing. Working to increase the number of people in higher paying jobs and decrease the number of lower paying jobs will bring a range of economic and social benefits. And whilst the Economy Minister recognises the need to end low paid jobs, her strategy only looks at improving productivity in order to do this. She has given no com commitments or recognition of the need to end scourge that is precarious work, which results in low pay. Developing the skills base of our young people and workforce should remain central to our economic success going forward. There are too many sections of our society where low skill levels and low education achievement are prevalent. I have real concerns that in a post-COVID-19 world, with significant competition for jobs, this section of society could face even greater challenges in securing employment. At the end of December 2020, 94,800 employees in the North were still on the furlough scheme. Therefore, the potential for the unemployment level to increase significantly over the next few months means that there will need to be a particular focus on adult education and opportunities to reskill and upskill. And whilst the economic recovery must be led by the Department for Economy, there is a responsibility for the executive as a whole to contribute. Transport and physical infrastructure is the responsibility of the infrastructure minister, and as infrastructural development is central to closing regional imbalances in economic recovery, it is important that the SDLP recognise this responsibility. And being from Fermanagh, a county without one single mile of dual carriageway, never mind a motorway, I could give you all a lesson on regional imbalances, but I'll leave that for another day. Point of order. Uh -huh. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, sorry. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we're in the middle of a very important debate, obviously a very important discussion, but we've had a debate for about an hour and a half where we're reaching that uh, point. We haven't had a single member uh, from parties who are not in the executive contribute uh, to that debate. So I would like to ask that your office consider that uh, for future debates to ensure that parties who are not on the executive aren't excluded from further debates. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll reflect that back indeed to the business committee. Um, I understand the point you're making, but within the time constraints of an hour and a half, the minister must be called one half an hour before uh, the conclusion of the debate. So uh, I'll reflect that back. Thank you, Gormag. And now I call the, the minister to respond to the points that have been made during the course of the debate. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And first of all, can I thank members for their contributions? COVID-19 has not just been about the economy. As a public health crisis, it has created havoc with our children and young people's ways of life, especially through the unprecedented disruption to our education systems. It has split family units in a way that no one, none of us could ever imagine. It has put pressure on a heroic health service, and most tragically of all, it has taken the lives of more than 2,000 people here in Northern Ireland. The decisions to impose such restrictions have been aligned with the respective health protective protection regulations brought forward by the Minister of Health and supported by the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor. Mr Speaker, there is no one in the Chamber more acutely aware of the economic done, uh, damage done by these restrictions than myself. Indeed, as Mr Stalford pointed out during his contributions, Whilst others have called for longer and more extreme lockdowns during this period, I have repeatedly highlighted the devastating effect that restrictions have on employment, our town and city centres, our high streets and our wider economy. No level of grants can compensate for the loss of trade incurred over the past year. Beyond this current restriction period, I believe that the best way to support local businesses is to have a safe, and sustainable reopening of the economy. Ms McLaughlin began the debate outlining the choice we all face between constantly complaining and moaning or finding solutions. 
She set the bar of expectation high, but perhaps I will leave it to others to judge which of the two options Ms McLaughlin opted for. She then spent some considerable time espousing the virtues of the protocol. Perhaps as cheerleaders for the protocol, we shouldn't be surprised by that. But Ms McLaughlin cannot hide her head in the sand to the damage being done to businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland as a direct result of the protocol. Indeed, her own party if you just give me one second, indeed her own party leader wrote to me asking for assistance to be given to businesses suffering as a direct result of the protocol. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for the Minister of giving way. Would the Minister agree with me that the protocol is in fact the problem, not indeed the solution in any way? Yes, I thank the member for his intervention. The protocol is indeed the problem. We did not have to be here. Um, and uh, there are those in this House who just today told us that we should be thankful for the protocol indeed. I don't know many businesses that are thanking anyone for the bureaucracy, the hindrances to trade and the disruption to the UK's internal market. Thank the Minister I will. Yes. Thank the Minister for giving, her, giving way. Um, she points out a very interesting document that she received from the leader uh, of the SDLP, Colin Eastwood MP. Does she find that in some way conflictory as to the actions of his party in this House, where they call for the rigorous implementation of the protocol? Yes, sometimes we do have to uh, ask for the real SDLP to stand up. But in this case, case I will defend Mr. Eastwood because I think he is genuinely reflecting the concern of his constituents and writing to me asking for some help in relation to those problems that the protocol brings about to businesses. Mr. Stewart, I, I, I do have to keep going. Mr. Stewart raised some of the problems being faced by businesses because of the protocol. And I can assure them that my department has been cataloguing these issues and engaging directly with our government uh, on these issues directly. Mr Buckley called for those supporting the protocol the pawns of the EU. Indeed, if this was a game of chess, those people would already have knocked over their king and accepted defeat. Northern Ireland is a great place to live, work and invest. I want to see us reach our full potential and grow our economy. But to do so, we must recognise the frictions and damage created by the protocol. Unless we have full and unfettered access to our most important market in GB, we simply cannot maximise our opportunity for economic success. I listened with some interest to the contribution from the Chair of the Economy Committee. Whilst I may not be a cheerleader for everything the Conservative Party has done of late, we absolutely must recognise the unprecedented level of financial support given to Northern Ireland from our national government, as well as the immense success of the national vaccine rollout across the United Kingdom, which has meant that over 30 per cent of our uh, citizens here in Northern Ireland has had at least one dose of the vaccine. As my colleague Mr Storey noted, being part of the United Kingdom matters. Since last April, my department has stepped up the challenge of providing financial support for businesses, employers uh, and those individuals impacted by COVID. My own department has provided in the region of half a billion pounds of support to tens of thousands of businesses and individuals. I am not going to outline the detail of every single scheme delivered my, my, by my department, not least because my colleague Mr Buckley started to do that for me, but I will write to all members to provide an overview. I am sure that members, including the Chair of the Economy Committee, will agree that it compares very favourably to other departments. My officials have sought to meet this challenge head on, working tirelessly to turn around schemes that would ordinarily have taken weeks. We owe them uh, our thanks for this uh, work that they have done. Along with our UK government initiatives such as the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme and the furlough schemes, collectively we have provided financial assistance to all sectors and occupations throughout Northern Ireland. 
I note and concur with the concerns raised in the motion with regard to the furlough scheme and the potential impact of it ending on the 30th of April. I have requested that the Chancellor reconsiders the state given the likelihood of significant job losses that would inevitably occur were it not to be extended. I believe that the economy needs more time to recover on a sustained basis before this financial support for employers and individuals could be removed, and I will continue to work to this end. In parallel, I will work with executive colleagues to consider how best to support those who most require ongoing financial assistance within the designated budget available, as well as working on the pathway to recovery and resilience beyond the COVID nightmare. In June 2020, I published our framework document, Rebuilding a Stronger Economy. Guided by this document, my department is now preparing to publish our Economic Recovery Action Plan. This plan will set out interventions required to assist people and businesses adjust to and recover from changing economic fundamentals called, caused by COVID-19 and EU exit. Four themes for recovery have been identified in the Recovery Action Plan. Stimulating research and development and innovation, supporting a highly skilled and agile workforce, promoting investment, trade and exports, and building a greener economy. Within each of the four themes, a suite of actions has been developed to promote a sustainable economic recovery. Needless to say, members will understand, as with the virus itself, the global economic consequences of COVID-19 are still unfolding. Therefore, it will be important that the action plan is agile and can evolve and adapt to meet the needs of our economy as we move through the crisis to recovery and back to economic prosperity. Looking ahead to this more stable and prosperous future, my department has also been working on the development of an economic vision for Northern Ireland. This separate and more strategic piece aims to communicate a plan for the next decade, which will guide our longer-term economic ambitions and direction. This economic vision will also identify the core sectors and technologies where Northern Ireland can demonstrate global leadership and the opportunities that exist for us to take advantage of our strengths in these areas. The next decade for the Northern Ireland economy must be a decade of innovation. I am confident that through an innovation-driven recovery, we will deliver long-term positive outcomes for all of our people. I also want to see a funding to allow me to deliver a comprehensive skills package. I need the support from the Economy Committee, uh, from this chamber and indeed wider society in helping me to gain the budget that I require to invest in skills. Without this investment in skills, we will stunt our economic growth and recovery potential. Whilst my department has and will continue to lead on all aspects of this work, economic development is a shared responsibility for those across the entirety of government, both at a devolved and national level. And I note uh, that the member from Fermanagh talked about uh, the importance of infrastructure. And of course, my department is currently delivering the largest infrastructure project ever delivered uh, in Northern Ireland, Project Stratum, delivered through DUP uh, confidence and supply funding for Northern Ireland. So in relation to the motion, of course, I will work with my fellow ministers on our immediate recovery plan and implementation and will continue to instigate the conversation and thinking to influence our longer terms of a globally competitive, regionally balanced and carbon neutral economy as per our joint commitments in the programme for government. Mr Speaker, may I again thank members for their contribution to today's debate. While I do not underestimate the challenge ahead of us as we continue to respond to COVID-19 and its economic and societal impacts, now is not the time for petty point scoring. Now is the time for real and genuine collaboration that puts our people and their economy first. I am confident that if we work together, not just within the Executive and Assembly, but right across all spectres of society, we will thrive as a nation. Thank you. And Nish Iram, Sir John O'Dowd, on uh, Lord Aaron Lasso to I now call John O'Dowd to speak to the amendment. Well, we are the last can call you. Uh, and I 
say I speak to the amendment and, and support the motion as amended. Uh, the proposer of the original motion, uh, Sinead McLaughlin, spoke about solutions and tackling inequality. Neither of those things I can argue against or would, would dream of arguing against. But if we are to find solutions to the economic devastation that is possibly facing us as a result of a number of elements, then it is crucial the executive works as one. Uh, that all executive ministers play their part in producing an economic recovery plan that creates well-paid jobs, that creates an end to inequality, that gives our society and our people hope uh, for the future. Because I think the, the consequences we face is almost the perfect storm. Um, facing Brexit on its own would have been bad enough for any devolved assembly with limited fiscal powers. But to face COVID-19 and Brexit and possibly uh, the, the accompanying world recession that's going to come for it is going to be a huge challenge for all the political parties involved in the executive and those who aren't involved in the executive as well. So we need a united front. And that's why I think the amendment to today's motion is important. Um, Members from the opposite benches have said, to a degree they are right, that the economy has been ruined as a result of the lockdown. Well, yes, to a certain degree, but what has ruined the economy is COVID-19. Nobody set out to close down the economy. Nobody's ambition was to close down the economy. And when I hear members say that uh, it has cost X amount of pounds to keep the economy closed. I, I went and just checked the latest figures for deaths across these islands. And across these islands, in this last year, 125,000 people have died as a result of COVID-19. Imagine we hadn't closed the economy down. Imagine if we hadn't to, in the response to the third wave, which has been devastating, not close the economy down. Mr. Buckley. I appreciate the member giving way, and I do understand and take reference to the point that he has made. Inevitably, yes, uh, the actions by the executive has helped save lives. But equally in that spirit, would the member also acknowledge that some of the restrictions put in place, both by the Department of Health on wider health services and indeed the economy, have had a knock-on impact on both mental well-being and indeed jobs, etc., and family life and well-being? What do you recognise? They have. I remind the member you have five minutes. I, I remind you again. 125,000 people have died. They cannot be replaced. Jobs can be replaced. Businesses can be replaced. Mental health can be treated. I accept it's a huge challenge for our society. It has to be part of our recovery. But when you look at the scale of what we have faced, it was the right decision to close down. Now what we have to decide is what we have to do to create a new economy. Because our economy was in trouble before COVID-19. It was in trouble as a result of the pending Brexit, and it was in trouble even before Brexit was mentioned. As a society, we have the lowest paid jobs in these islands. We have the lowest economic output in these islands. We have the lowest quality standard of living in these islands. And that was before Brexit, before COVID-19, and before anybody heard of the protocol. So, we have a long, long way to go to cry and create a fair economic recovery for all. Very, very quickly. Will the member also expect that, accept that we sometimes can create a situation of doom and gloom in here? There were 5.7 per cent an increase in new businesses registered in Northern Ireland in 2020. And we also need to give confidence to the community. We do. Well, you need to reflect on that yourself, Mr. Story. Is your campaign against the protocol giving confidence to the business community or is it causing difficulties within the business community? Because at the early stages of the campaign around the protocol, your leader quite rightly pointed out that there are huge economic opportunities for businesses as a result of the protocol. Invest and I now have inquiries coming in from across the globe as to how businesses could set up here to create jobs and prosperity for our people. So, but when those businesses are looking at scenes, such as we have seen at Lorne or at Belfast, or we see scenes from, ask our the to bring his remarks to close, from our political please. leaders saying that we are facing crisis, that does not give confidence. So let us use the opportunities that are in front of us. I accept there are problems, 
for some businesses around protocol, but there are huge opportunities as a result of the protocol. I guess next year, I'm sure Matthew Toole. Le conclude January and Gisbracht. I now call Matthew Toole to conclude on the debate. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can, can I just check, Mr. Deputy Speaker? I have ten minutes to wind. I will try. I will try not to use all all my ten minutes. I'll try and be uncharacteristically uh, concise, Mr. Deputy Speaker. First of all, let me start by thanking everyone um, who contributed to today's uh, debate uh, for their contributions. It's clearly vital that we. Um, discuss these issues. They are critical and fundamental to why uh, we are all here, whether we agree uh, or not on individual, um, uh, on individual economic issues. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, as we debate this motion today, we all hope that we are nearing the end of this most acute phase of a pandemic that has changed the lives of virtually everyone on this planet. And we heard from John O'Dowd, the previous speaker, uh, that in these islands 125,000 people have died. Uh, and I'm glad that he uh, drew our attention to that, because that is the most fundamental and critical thing we should all bear in mind when we're responding to the, um, uh, the consequences of the pandemic, uh, including the economic consequences to the pa of the pandemic. In this part of the world, we are sometimes liable to dwell on how unique and distinctive we are. And we are, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, but in the face of a once-in-a-lifetime public health crisis, this Assembly and this jurisdiction is facing many of the same dilemmas being faced around the world. How do we keep as many people as possible healthy? How do we minimise death? How do we avoid our health services collapsing? How do we vaccinate our people quickly? Uh, but how also do we ensure that we have a fairer and greener economy when we finally emerge from what we all agree is a hateful hibernation? Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that's what today's motion is all about. It's about, uh, according to my party, emerging from our hateful hibernation uh, in a fairer and greener way, addressing the very many long-standing structural issues that have affected our economy, but also taking advantage of the unique and distinct place that we find ourselves in uh, as a result of the protocol, but not exclusively, uh, but not exclusively because of that. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to touch briefly before I come on to some of my main arguments and summing up today. I want to come on to some of the arguments that were made uh, by, uh, by colleagues from across the House throughout uh, this uh, debate. Kiva Archibald, who has moved uh, the amendment, which we, we don't agree with, though I, I can understand, in, in, in a sense, uh, the, the point of, um, of, of the amendment. But we think it is important. I'm glad the minister is here today to respond to this debate. That we are specific in our holding to account of ministers for the delivery of an economic strategy. Uh, but uh, among the things that Kiva uh, Ar Archibald said uh, was that we need to deliver on a just transition. We absolutely agree with that. That's why, um, uh, that's why we've talked about it um, uh, today. Uh, my constituency colleague, Christopher Stalford, who's no longer in the chamber, uh, uh, talked about the importance of opening up the economy as quickly as possible. And as I uh, said when I intervened on him earlier on, uh, unfortunately this opens up the false dichotomy, uh, which I think far too many people have been prone to, both in this debate and, frankly, uh, on the opposite side of the House when talking about the economic challenges of COVID. The idea that somehow there is a public health response and then there is the economy. And if you would just open the, everything up, then you just get back. You just open the shops and the restaurants and the pubs, and we could all get back to normal. That's, I'm afraid, just a fantasy. Sadly, that's not the case. And I'm afraid even the minister herself, in her response, was slightly indulging this notion that somehow these two are in opposition to one another. We can't. There is no uh, economic response without a comprehensive and effective public health response. There is no way uh, of. Um, recovering our economy unless when we lift the restrictions we are doing so in a durable and sustainable way. I am afraid the lesson that some of us had to learn, all of us in this society had to learn before Christmas, is that if you precipitously raise uh, ease restrictions in a way that is unplanned in order to narrowly prioritise short-term uh, economic interests, then you do have very negative public health consequences. I do not want to dwell on that point for too long, but it is a very, very um, important one. Um, uh, a noise is off from, from, from a sedentary position from the member for North Antrim, who talked in his contribution about um, uh, he talked about um, again he talked like others about the, 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 the effects of lockdown. He also talked about um, uh, working together in the executive, uh, but also how he thought fiscal powers were a bad idea. Well, I'd like to ask him what uh, are his uh, bright ideas for overhauling the way we do uh, economic policy in this place, and I'll happily give way to him. I see him moving towards the mic. 
uh, just to remind the member, I wasn't the person, it was the party opposite who raised the issue about fiscal powers, and uh, John O'Dowd has raised it again. What we are saying is, let's hear from the party opposite and yourselves what are your plans. And if they're anything like the plans we saw previously, Derry City Airport will probably be back up for sale again. Well, I would say two things. Uh, I could keep you here all day. Uh, the honour, I could keep the honourable member here all day to tell him what my and my party, I and my party's plans are for greater fiscal powers. They'd be matched to proper long-term economic strategy. And I tell you what, they wouldn't be. They wouldn't be the kinds of use of fiscal powers that Sammy Wilson demonstrated ten years ago when he actively sought a new fiscal power from the Treasury in London, only to use it to subsidise uh, non-existent transatlantic flights, which cost us two and a half million pounds every year. I want more fiscal powers to this place. But I tell you what I want to do, I want to use them better than Sammy Wilson did, giving away two and a half million quid out of the block grant every year. So every time the member opposite lectures me about fiscal responsibility, I'm going to lecture you back about the Sammy tax. Happy to give way to Johnny Buckley. And getting back to the motion before us, and look, I do agree with the initial sentiment about recovery and investment strategy, but is it not a case that the very amendment removes the politics from the motion and calls for that collective strategy? And if that is the case, why can't the members' party support it? Well, I think, the, to come back to the point I made before, our, um, our motion is, yes, it's about uh, an executive approach, but it's also about holding people accountable. And in the nicest possible way, I'm glad the Minister's here today and we are holding her accountable. I just want to come on to a couple of other uh, comments from members before I, uh, I move on to some of my points. Um, John Stewart um, was exactly right when he talked about um, the very many issues uh, that face uh, our economy in relation to COVID. He talked about job start and apprenticeships, and we agree with him uh, on those. But can I also say, John uh, Stewart moved on to talk about the um, issues uh, that have arisen as a result of the protocol, which is in itself a consequence of Brexit. And I heard earlier on the member who's just intervened on me say that uh, he, I think, literally dismissed the idea that east-west disruption that we've seen on goods moving from Britain to Northern Ireland were a consequence of um, uh, he said they weren't a consequence of Brexit, I believe. Um, my God, I mean, what cognitive dissonance. I mean, there literally would not be a protocol if there was not Brexit, and there wouldn't be, certainly be a protocol if we hadn't had uh, a series of um, uh, opportunities for a softer all-UK Brexit, one that would have avoided disruption in the Irish Sea, spurned, uh, I won't give away, I'm again, I've been generous so far, spurned by the party opposite. But let me come on to uh, the protocol. Uh, let me come on to uh, a key thing that we are discussing here today. We are in a situation, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, where we face uh, one of the biggest economic crises uh, any of us have lived through. Possibly it will dwarf even the financial crisis of uh, 2008. And we don't know uh, when we're going to fully emerge from it. We hope that we will see sustainable global economic growth, but we don't know the path of that recovery. We don't know how well the rest of the, the, the globe will do in terms of vaccination. So there's a huge degree of uncertainty, and, and, uh, and I recognise that, and that doesn't make the Minister's job any easier. But at the beginning of my remarks, Mr Deputy Speaker, I talked about the fact that this place is unique and distinctive, and sometimes we focus a little bit too much on how unique and distinctive it is. Well, the truth is that our unique and distinctive nature has meant that because of the particular circumstances we find ourselves in post-Brexit, we have a unique selling point. I didn't want Brexit. I didn't want Brexit so much that I left a career over it. The only reason I'm here is because of Brexit, because I found the consequences for Northern Ireland and the whole island of Ireland too uh, unacceptable. I came here. That's why I got involved in politics. But the protocol means that we, not just unlike any other part of these islands, but any other part of this continent, have unique, untrammeled, unfettered access from Northern Ireland into both the British market, which I agree with all the members opposite who keep saying it is critical to our economy, but also to the European single market of 450 million people. That's unique on this continent. We know there are issues being faced by uh, food producers, for example, in Britain, people who make Scottish longestines, Somerset cheddar, Welsh lamb uh, farmers. They can't get their produce to uh, supermarket shelves and restaurants when they reopen on the continent quickly enough. Well, we have replacements for all those products. For every Scottish Longestine, there's a port, port of Voogie prawn. For Somerset cheddar, there's cool rain cheddar. For Welsh lamb, there's lamb for the morning sparrows. The members opposite shake their heads, but it's true. That's why Invest and I, who work for the, for the minister, are looking at these opportunities. Life sciences, highly regulated manufacturing. We have some great pharmaceutical companies in Northern Ireland. We have Almac in the members' constituency. We have Norbrook. Uh, 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 by the border in, in Newry. These are, we have an established life sciences sector. 
That is exactly the kind of thing that would benefit from, and the Minister, I'm sure, knows this, because I'm sure Invest and I have told her this, who can trade, benefit from the protocol from access to both markets. Why not, when we're talking about the just economy, thank you, why not, when we're talking about the just economy, uh, the just transition, don't we focus on our uh, access to both the European Green Deal and also the Green Industrial Revolution that Boris Johnson keeps talking about? Let's maximise the opportunities that we have, our unique place in this continent. Let's stop talking down the Northern Ireland economy, something that people on this side of the chamber are often accused of. Now it's people on that Members side of the chamber who are, who are talking us down. Let's maximise the opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I should say I commend this motion to the Assembly. Okay, members. Uh, the question is that the amendment standing in the names of Kiva Archibald, John O'Dowd, Philip McGuigan, and Gemma Dolan be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. All again. I'll start. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I, I believe. I believe the the ayes have that. I believe the ayes have it. Um, okay, members. Now uh, the question now is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. Okay, the motion, as amended, is subsequently passed and agreed by the Assembly. And the motion is standing on the order paper now as agreed. Okay. Final item of business is item number seven on the order paper, which is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you.